This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 7 In the Heart of the Hibernian Metropolis. Before Nelson's pillar trams slowed, shunted, changed trolley, started for Black Rock, Kingstown, and Dalkey, Klonsky, Rathgar, and Terenure, Palmerston Park, and Upper Rath mines, Sandy Mount Green, Rath mines, Ringsend, and Sandy Mount Tower, Herald's Cross. The Horse Dublin United Tramway Company's timekeeper bawled them off. Rathgar and Terenure? Come on, Sandy Mount Green! Right and left, parallel clanging, ringing a double decker and a single deck, moved from their railhead, swerved to the down line, glided parallel. Start Palmerston Park. The wearer of the crown. Under the porch of the general post office, shoe blacks called and polished. Parked in North Princes Street, His Majesty's Vermilion mail cars, bearing on their sides the royal initials E. R., received loudly flung sacks of letters, postcards, letter cards, parcels, insured and paid, for local, provincial, British, and overseas delivery. Gentlemen of the Press. Gross-booted draymen rolled barrels dull-thudding out of Prince's stores and bumped them up the brewery float. On the brewery float bumped dull-thudding barrels rolled by gross-booted draymen out of Prince's stores. "'There it is,' Red Murray said. "'Alexander Keyes.' "'Just cut it out, will you?' Mr. Bloom said, and I'll take it round to the telegraph office. The door of Rutledge's office creaked again. Davy Stevens, minute in a large cape coat, a small felt hat crowning his ringlets, passed out a roll of papers under his cape, a king's courier. Red Murray's long shears sliced out the advertisement from the newspaper in four clean strokes, scissors and paste. "'I'll go through the printing works,' Mr. Bloom said, taking the cut square. "'Of course, if he wants a par,' Red Murray said earnestly, a pen behind his ear, "'we can do him one.' "'Right,' Mr. Bloom said with a nod. "'I'll rub that in.' "'We.' Oui. "'William Braden, Esquire of Oakland's Sandy Mount.' Red Murray touched Mr. Bloom's arms with the shears and whispered, "'Braden.' Mr. Bloom turned and saw the liveried porter raise his lettered cap as a stately figure entered between the newsboards of the weekly Freeman and National Press and the Freeman's Journal and National Press. Dull thudding Guinness's barrels. It passed statelily up the staircase, steered by an umbrella, a solemn beard-framed face. The broadcloth back ascended each step. Back. All of his brains are in the nape of his neck, Simon Dedalus says, welts of flesh behind on him. Fat folds of neck. Fat, neck, fat. "'Don't you think his face is like our saviour? Red Murray whispered. The door of Rutledge's office whispered. They always build one door opposite another for the wind to, way in, way out. Our saviour, beard-framed oval face, talking in the dark. Mary, Martha, steered by an umbrella sword to the footlights. Mario the tenor. "'Or like Mario,' Mr. Bloom said. "'Yes,' Red Murray agreed. But Mario was said to be the very picture of our saviour. "'Jesus Mario, with rougy cheeks, doublet and spindle legs, hand on his heart, in Martha. The Crozier and the Pen. His Grace phoned down twice this morning, Red Murray said gravely. They watched the knees, legs, boots vanish. Neck. A telegram boy stepped in nimbly, threw an envelope on the counter, and stepped off post-haste with a word. Freeman! Mr. Bloom said slowly, Well, he is one of our saviors also. A meek smile accompanied him as he lifted the counter flap. As he passed in through a side door and along the warm dark stairs and passage, along the now reverberating boards. But will he save the circulation? Thumping, thumping. He pushed in through the glass swing door and entered, stepping over strewn packing paper. Through a lane of clanking drums he made his way toward Nanetti's reading closet. Hines here, too, account of the funeral, probably. Thumping, thump. With unfeigned regret, it is, we announce the dissolution of a most respected Dublin Burgess. This morning the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam. Machines. Smash a man to atoms if they got him caught. Rule the world today. His machineries are pegging away, too. Like these, got out of hand. Fermenting. Working away, tearing away, and that old grey rat tearing to get in. How a great daily organist turned out. Mr. Bloom halted behind the foreman's spare body, admiring a glossy crown. Strange he never saw his real country. Ireland, my country. Member for College Green. He boomed that workaday worker tack for all it was worth. It's the ads and side features sell a weekly, not the stale news in the official gazette. Queen Anne is dead. Published by authority in the year 1000 and demen situate in the town of Rosnallis, barony of Tinnehinch. To all whom it may concern, schedule pursuant to statute showing return of number of mules and jennets exported from Bellina. 
Nature Notes, Cartoons, Phil Blake's Weekly Pat and Bull Story, Uncle Toby's Page for Tiny Tots, Country Bumpkin's Queries, Dear Mr. Editor, What is a Good Cure for Flatulence? I'd like that part. Learn a lot teaching others. The Personal Note, M.A.P., Mainly All Pictures, Shapely Bathers on Golden Strand, World's Biggest Balloon, Double Marriage of Sisters Celebrated, Two Bridegrooms Laughing Heartily at Each Other, Caprani, too, Printer, More Irish Than the Irish. The machines clanked in three-four time. Thump, thump, thump. Now if he got paralyzed there, and no one knew how to stop them, they'd clank on and on the same, print it over and over and up and back, monkey-doodle the whole thing. Want a cool head. Well, get it into the evening edition, Counselor, Hines said. Soon be calling him my Lord Mayor. Long John is backing him, they say. The foreman, without answering, scribbled press on a corner of the sheet and made a sign to a typesetter. He handed the sheet silently over the dirty glass screen. Right, thanks, Hines said, moving off. Mr. Bloom stood in his way. If you want to draw, the cashier is just going to lunch, he said, pointing backward with his thumb. Did you? Hines asked. Mm, Mr. Bloom said, look sharp and you'll catch him. Thanks, old man, Hines said. I'll tap him, too. He hurried on eagerly toward the Freeman's Journal. Three bob I lent him in Makers. Three weeks. Third hint. We see the canvasser at work. Mr. Bloom laid his cutting on Mr. Nanetti's desk. Excuse me, counselor, he said. This ad, you see, keys, you remember? Mr. Ninetti considered the cutting a while, and nodded. He wants it in for July, Mr. Bloom said. The foreman moved his pencil toward it. But wait, Mr. Bloom said, he wants it changed. Keys, you see, he wants two keys at the top. Hell of a racket they make. He doesn't hear it. Iron nerves. Maybe he understands what I— The foreman turned round to hear patiently, and lifting an elbow began to scratch slowly in the armpit of his alpaca jacket. Like that, Mr. Bloom said, crossing his forefingers at the top. Let him take that in first. Mr. Bloom, glancing sideways up from the cross he had made, saw the foreman's sallow face, think he has a touch of jaundice, and beyond the obedient reels feeding in huge webs of paper. Clank it, clank it, miles of it unreeled. What becomes of it after? Oh, wrap-up meat, parcels, various uses, a thousand and one things. Slipping his words deftly into the pauses of the clanking, he drew swiftly on the scarred woodwork. House of Keys. Like that, see? Two crossed keys here. A circle, then here the name. Alexander Keys, tea, wine, and spirit merchant. So on. Better not teach him his own business. You know yourself, counselor, just what he wants. Then round the top in let it, the House of Keys. You see? Do you think that's a good idea? The foreman moved his scratching hand to his lower ribs and scratched there quietly. The idea, Mr. Bloom said, is the House of Keys. You know, counselor, the Manx Parliament. Innuendo of home rule. Tourists, you know, from the Isle of Man. Catches the eye, you see. Can you do that? I could ask him, perhaps, about how to pronounce that folio. But then, if he didn't know, only make it awkward for him. Better not. We can do that, the foreman said. Have you the design? I can get it, Mr. Bloom said. It was in a Kilkenny paper. He has a house there, too. I'll just run out and ask him. Well, you can do that, and just a little par calling attention. You know the usual. High-class, licensed premises. Long-felt wants, so on. The foreman thought for an instant. We can do that, he said. Let him give us a three months renewal. A typesetter brought him a limp galley page. He began to check it silently. Mr. Bloom stood by, hearing the loud throbs of cranks, watching the silent typesetters at their cases. Orthographical. Wanting to be sure of his spelling, proof fever, Martin Cunningham forgot to give us his spelling bee conundrum this morning. It is amusing to view the unpar one or an allel d'embara two r's, is it? Double s of a harassed peddler while gauging A.U. the symmetry with a Y of a peeled pear under a cemetery wall. Silly, isn't it? Cemetery put in, of course, on account of the symmetry. I should have said when he clapped on his topper. Thank you. I ought to have said something about an old hat or something. No, I could have said, looks as good as new now. See his fizz then. The nethermost deck of the first machine jodged forward its flyboard with silk the first batch of choir-folded papers. Almost human the way it silk to call attention, doing its level best to speak. That door, too, creaking, asking to be shut. Everything speaks in its own way. Noted churchman, an occasional contributor. The foreman handed back the galley page, suddenly saying, Wait, where's the archbishop's letter? It's to be repeated in the telegraph. Where's what's-his-name? He looked about him round his loud, unanswering machines. Monks, sir? A voice asked from the casting box. Aye, where's Monks? Monks? Mr. Bloom took up his cutting. Time to get out. 
"'Then I'll get the design, Mr. Nanetti,' he said, "'and you'll give it a good place, I know.' "'Monks!' "'Yes, sir?' Three months renewal. Want to get some wind off my chest first. Try it anyhow. Rub in August. Good idea. Horse show month. Ballsbridge. Tourists over for the show. A day father. He walked on through the case room, passing an old man, bowed, spectacled, aproned. Old monks. The day father. Queer lot of stuff he must have put through his hands in his time. Obituary notices, pubs ads, speeches, divorce suits, found drowned. Nearing the end of his tether now. Sober, serious man, with a bit in the savings bank, I'd say. Wife a good cook and washer. Daughter working a machine in the parlor. Plain Jane. No damn nonsense. And it was the feast of the Passover. He stayed in his walk to watch a typesetter neatly distributing type. Reads it backwards first. Quickly he does it. Must require some practice, that. Poor Papa with his Haggadah book, reading backwards with his finger to me. Pesach. Next year in Jerusalem. Dear, oh dear, all that long business about that brought us out of the land of Egypt and into the house of bondage. Alleluia, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Elohenu. No, that's the other one. Then the twelve brothers, Jacob's sons. And then the lamb and the cat and the dog and the stick and the water and the butcher. And then the angel of death kills the butcher and he kills the ox and the dog kills the cat. Sounds a bit silly till you come to look into it well. Justice it means, but it's everybody eating everybody else. That's what life is, after all. How quickly he does that job. Practice makes perfect. Seems to see with his fingers. Mr. Bloom passed on out of the clanking noises through the gallery onto the landing. Now am I going to tram it out all the way and then catch him out, perhaps. Better phone him up first. Number? Yes. Same as Citron's house. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight double four. Only once more that soap. He went down the house staircase. Who the deuce scrawled all over these walls with matches? Looks as if they did it for a bet. Heavy, greasy smell there always is in those works. Lukewarm glue in Tom's next door when I was there. He took out his handkerchief to dab his nose. Citron lemon. Ah, the soap I put there. Lose it out of that pocket. Putting back his handkerchief, he took out the soap and stowed it away, buttoned, into the hip pocket of his trousers. What perfume does your wife use? I could go home still. Tram. Something I forgot. Just to see before dressing. No, here. No. A sudden screech of laughter came from the evening telegraph office. Know who that is? What's up? Pop in a minute to phone. Ned Lambert it is. He entered softly. Aaron, green gem of the silver sea. The ghost walks, Professor McHugh murmured softly, biscuitfully, to the dusty window pane. Mr. Dedalus, staring from the empty fireplace at Ned Lambert's quizzing face, asked of it sourly, "'Agonizing Christ, wouldn't it give you a heartburn on your arse?' Ned Lambert, seated on the table, read on. "'Or again, note the meanderings of some purling rill as it babbles on its way, though quarrelling with the stony obstacles, to the tumbling waters of Neptune's blue domain, mid mossy banks, fanned by gentlest zephyrs, played on by the glorious sunlight or neath the shadows cast o'er its pensive bosom by the overarching leafage of the giants of the forest. "'What about that, Simon?' he asked over the fringe of his newspaper. "'How's that for high?' "'Changing his drink,' Mr. Dedalus said. Ned Lambert, laughing, struck the newspaper on his knees, repeating, "'The pensive bosom and the overarsing leafage. Oh, boys, oh, boys!' "'And Xenophon looked upon Marathon,' Mr. Dedalus said, looking again in the fireplace and to the windows, "'and Marathon looked on the sea. "'That will do,' Professor McHugh cried from the window. "'I don't want to hear any more of the stuff.' He ate off the crescent of water-biscuit he had been nibbling, and, hungered, made ready to nibble the biscuit in his other hand. Highfalutin stuff. Bladder-bags. Ned Lambert is taking a day off, I see. Rather upsets a man's day, a funeral does. He has influence, they say. Old Chatterton, the vice-chancellor, is his grand-uncle or his great-grand-uncle. Close on ninety, they say. Sub-leader for his death written this long time, perhaps. Living to spite them, might go first himself. Johnny, make room for your uncle. The right honourable Hedges heir Chattington. Dare say he writes him an odd shaky check or two on gale days. Windfall when he kicks out. Alleluia. Just another spasm, Ned Lambert said. What is it? Mr. Bloom asked. A recently discovered fragment of Cicero, Professor McHugh answered with pomp of tone. Our lovely land. Short but to the point. Whose land? Mr. Bloom said simply. Most pertinent question the professor said between his chews, with an accent on the who's. 
"'Dan Dawson's land,' Mr. Dedalus said. "'Is it his speech last night?' Mr. Bloom asked. Ned Lambert nodded. "'But listen to this,' he said. The doorknob hit Mr. Bloom in the small of the back as the door was pushed in. "'Excuse me,' J. J. O'Malloy said, entering. Mr. Bloom moved nimbly aside. "'I beg yours,' he said. "'Good day, Jack. Come in, come in. Good day. How are you, Dedalus? Well, and yourself?' J. J. O'Malloy shook his head. Sad. Cleverest fellow at the junior bar he used to be. Decline, poor chap. That hectic flush spells finis for a man. Touch and go with him. What's in the wind, I wonder? Money worry. Or again, if we but climb the serried mountain peaks. You're looking extra. Is the editor to be seen? J. J. O'Malloy asked, looking towards the inner door. Very much so, Professor McHugh said. To be seen and heard. He's in his sanctum with Lenehan. J. J. O'Malloy strolled to the sloping desk and began to turn back the pink pages of the file. Practice dwindling. A might have been. Losing heart. Gambling. Debts of honour. Reaping the whirlwind. Used to get good retainers from D. and T. Fitzgerald. Their wigs to show the grey matter. Brains on their sleeve, like the statue in Glasnevin. Believe he does some literary work for the Express with Gabriel Conroy. Well-read fellow. Miles Crawford began on the Independent. Funny the way those newspaper men veer about when they get wind of a new opening. Weathercocks, hot and cold in the same breath, wouldn't know which to believe. One story good till you hear the next. Go for one another bald-headed in the papers, and then all blows over. Hail fellow, well met the next moment. Ah, listen to this for God's sake, Ned Lambert pleaded. Or again, if we but climb the serried mountain peaks. Bombast, the professor broke in testily. Enough of the inflated windbag. Peaks, Ned Lambert went on, towering high on high, to bathe our souls, as it were. Bathe his lips, Mr. Dedalus said. Blessed and eternal God. Yes, is he taking anything for it? As twere, in the peerless panorama of Ireland's portfolio, unmatched, despite their well-praised prototypes and other vaunted prize regions, for very beauty, of bosky grove and undulating plain and luscious pasture-land of vernal green, steeped in the transcendent translucent glow of our mild mysterious Irish twilight. His native Doric. The moon, Professor McHugh said. He forgot Hamlet. That mantles the vista far and wide, and wait till the glowing orb of the moon shine forth to irradiate her silver effulgence. Oh, Mr. Dedalus cried, giving vent to a hopeless groan. Shite and onions! That'll do, Ned. Life is too short. He took off his silk hat, and, blowing out impatiently his bushy moustache, Welsh combed his hair with raking fingers. Ned Lambert tossed the newspaper aside, chuckling with delight. An instant after a hoarse bark of laughter burst over Professor McHugh's unshaven, black-spectacled face. "'There we daw!' he cried. What Weatherup said. "'All very fine to jeer at it now in cold print, but it goes down like hot cake, that stuff. He was in the bakery line, too, wasn't he? Why they call him Doey Daw. Feathered his nest well, anyhow. Daughter engaged to that chap in the Inland Revenue office with the motor. Hooked that nicely.' Entertainments, open house, big blowout. Weatherup always said that. Get a grip of them by the stomach. The inner door was opened violently, and a scarlet beaked face, crested by a comb of feathery hair, thrust itself in. The bold blue eyes stared about them, and the harsh voice asked, What is it? And here comes the sham squire himself, Professor McHugh said grandly. Get out of that, you bloody old pedagogue, the editor said in recognition. "'Come, Ned,' Mr. Dedalus said, putting on his hat. "'I must get a drink after that.' "'Drink,' the editor cried. "'No drinks served before mass.' "'Quite right, too,' Mr. Dedalus said, going out. "'Come on, Ned.' Ned Lambert sidled down from the table. The editor's blue eyes roved toward Mr. Bloom's face, shadowed by a smile. "'Will you join us, Miles?' Mr. Lambert asked. Memorable battles recalled. "'North Cork Militia,' the editor cried, striding to the mantelpiece. "'We won every time.' North Cork and Spanish officers. Where was that, Miles? Ned Lambert asked, with a reflective glance at his toe caps. In Ohio, the editor shouted. So it was, Bigad, Ned Lambert agreed. Passing out, he whispered to J. J. O'Malloy, Incipient jigs, sad case. Ohio, the editor crowed in high treble from his uplifted scarlet face. My Ohio. A perfect critic, the professor said, long, short, and long. O oh, harp Aeolian. He took a reel of dental floss from his waistcoat pocket, and, breaking off a piece, twanged it smartly between two and two of his resonant, unwashed teeth. Bing-bang, bing-bang. 
Mr. Bloom, seeing the coast clear, made for the inner door. "'Just a moment, Mr. Crawford,' he said. "'I just want to phone about an ad.' He went in. "'What about that leader this evening?' Professor McHugh asked, coming to the editor and laying a firm hand on his shoulder. "'That'll be all right,' Miles Crawford said, more calmly. "'Never you fret. Hello, Jack, that's all right.' "'Good day, Miles,' J. J. O'Malloy said, letting the pages he held slip limply back on the file. "'Is that Canada Swindle case on today?' The telephone word inside. Twenty-eight, no, twenty, double four, yes. Spot the winner. Lenahan came out of the inner office with sports tissues. Who wants a dead cert for the gold cup, he asked. Scepter with O'Madden up. He tossed the tissues onto the table. Screams of newsboys barefoot in the hall rushed near, and the door was flung open. Hush, Lenahan said. I hear feet stoops. Professor McHugh strode across the room and seized the cringing urchin by the collar as the others scampered out of the hall and down the steps. The tissues rustled up in the draft, floated softly in the air-blue scrawls, and under the table came to earth. "'It wasn't me, sir. It was the big fellow shoved me, sir.' "'Throw him out and shut the door,' the editor said. "'There's a hurricane blowing.' Lenahan began to paw the tissues up from the floor, grunting as he stooped twice. "'Waiting for the racing special, sir,' the newsboy said. "'It was Pat Farrell shoved me, sir.' He pointed to two faces peering in round the doorframe. "'Him, sir.' "'Out of this with you,' Professor McHugh said gruffly. He hustled the boy out and banged the door, too. J. J. O'Malloy turned the files crackingly over, murmuring, seeking. Continued on page six, column four. "'Yes, evening telegraph here,' Mr. Bloom phoned from the inner office. "'Is the boss—' "'Yes, telegraph.' "'To where?' "'Aha, which auction rooms?' "'I see. Right, I'll catch him.' A collision ensues. The bell whirred again as he rang off. He came in quickly and bumped against Lenahan, who was struggling up with the second tissue. "'Pardon, monsieur,' Lenahan said, clutching him for an instant and making a grimace. "'My fault,' Mr. Bloom said, suffering his grip. "'Are you hurt? I'm in a hurry.' "'Knee,' Lenahan said. He made a comic face and whined, rubbing his knee. "'The accumulation of the Anno Domini.' "'Sorry,' Mr. Bloom said. He went to the door, and, holding it ajar, paused. J. J. O'Malloy slapped the heavy pages over. The noise of two shrill voices, a mouth-organ, echoed in the bare hallway from the newsboys squatted on the doorsteps. "'We are the boys of Wexford who fought with heart and hand.' Exit Bloom. "'I'm just running round to Bachelor's Walk,' Mr. Bloom said, about this ad of keys. Want to fix it up. They tell me he's round there in Dillon's.' He looked indecisively for a moment at their faces. The editor, who, leaning against the mantel-shelf, had propped his head on his hand, suddenly stretched forth an arm amply. "'Be gone,' he said. "'The world is before you.' "'Back in no time,' Mr. Bloom said, hurrying out. J. J. O'Malloy took the tissues from Lenehan's hand and read them, blowing them apart gently, without comment. "'He'll get that advertisement,' the professor said, staring through his black-rimmed spectacles over the cross-blind. "'Look at the young scamps after him.' "'Show! Where?' Lenehan cried, running to the window. A street cortege. Both smiled over the cross-blind at the file of capering newsboys in Mr. Bloom's wake, the last zigzagging white on the breeze a mocking kite, a tail of white bow-knots. "'Look at the young gutter snipe behind him, hue and cry,' Lenehan said, "'and you'll kick. Oh, my rib risible! Taking off his flat spogs in the walk, small nines steal upon marks.' He began to mazurka in swift caricature across the floor on sliding feet past the fireplace to J. J. O'Malloy, who placed the tissues in his receiving hands. "'What's that?' Miles Crawford said with a start. "'Where are the other two gone?' "'Who?' the professor said, turning. "'They're gone round to the Oval for a drink. Paddy Hooper is there with Jack Hall. Came over last night.' "'Come on, then,' Miles Crawford said. "'Where's my hat?' He walked jerkily into the office behind— parting the vent of his jacket, jingling his keys in his back pocket. They jingled then in the air and against the wood as he locked his desk drawer. "'He's pretty well on,' Professor McHugh said in a low voice. "'Seems to be,' J. J. O'Malloy said, taking out a cigarette case in murmuring meditation. "'But it is not always as it seems. Who has the most matches?' The Calumet of Peace He offered a cigarette to the professor and took one himself. Lenehan promptly struck a match for them and lit their cigarettes in turn. J. J. O'Malloy opened his case again and offered it. "'Thank you,' Lenehan said, helping himself. 
The editor came from the inner office, a straw hat awry on his brow. He declaimed in song, pointing sternly at Professor McHugh. "'Twas rank and fame that tempted thee, "'twas empire charmed thy heart." The professor grinned, locking his long lips. "'Eh, you bloody old Roman empire,' Miles Crawford said. He took a cigarette from the open case. Lenahan, lighting it for him with quick grace, said, "'Silence for my brand-new riddle.' "'Imperium Romanum,' J. J. O. Malloy said gently. "'It sounds nobler than British or Brixton.' The word reminds one somehow of fat in the fire. Miles Crawford blew his first puff violently towards the ceiling. That's it, he said. We are the fat. You and I are the fat in the fire. We haven't got the chance of a snowball in hell. The grandeur that was Rome. Wait a moment, Professor McHugh said, raising two quiet claws. We mustn't be led away by words, by sounds of words. We think of Rome, imperial, imperious, imperative. He extended elocutionary arms from frayed stained shirt cuffs, pausing. What was their civilization? Vast, I allow, but vile. Cloacae, sewers, the Jews in the wilderness and on the mountain top said, It is meet to be here. Let us build an altar to Jehovah. The Roman, like the Englishman who follows in his footsteps, brought to every new shore on which he set his foot, on our shore he never set it, only his cloacal obsession. He gazed about him in his toga, and he said, It is meet to be here. Let us construct a water-closet. Which they accordingly did do, Lenehan said. Our old ancient ancestors, as we read in the first chapter of Guinnesses, were partial to the running stream. They were nature's gentlemen, J. J. O'Molloy murmured. But we have also Roman law. And Pontius Pilate is its prophet, Professor McHugh responded. Do you know that story about Chief Baron Pallas? J. J. O'Molloy asked. It was at the Royal University dinner. Everything was going swimmingly. First, my riddle, Lenehan said. Are you ready? Mr. O'Madden Burke, tall in copious grey of Donegal Tweed, came in from the hallway. Stephen Dedalus, behind him, uncovered as he entered. Entree, mes enfants, Lenehan cried. I escort a suppliant, Mr. O'Madden Burke said melodiously. Youth led by experience visits notoriety. How do you do? the editor said, holding out a hand. Come in. Your governor is just gone. Lenehan said to all, Silence! What opera resembles a railway line? Reflect, ponder, excogitate, reply. Stephen handed over the typed sheets, pointing to the title and signature. Who? the editor asked. Bit torn off. Mr. Garrett Deasy, Stephen said. That old pelters, the editor said. Who tore it? Was he short taken? On swift sail flaming from storm and south, he comes, pale vampire, mouth to my mouth. "'Good day, Stephen,' the professor said, coming to peer over their shoulders. "'Foot and mouth. Are you turned? Bullock befriending bard. "'Shindy in well-known restaurant.' "'Good day, sir,' Stephen answered, blushing. "'The letter is not mine. Mr. Garrett Deasy asked me to—' "'Oh, I know him,' Miles Crawford said, and I knew his wife, too. "'The bloodiest old tartar God ever made. By Jesus, she had the foot-and-mouth disease, and no mistake. "'The night she threw the soup in the waiter's face in the star and garter— a woman brought sin into the world, for Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus, ten years the Greeks, O'Rourke, Prince of Brethne. "'Is he a widower?' Stephen asked. "'I a grass one,' Miles Crawford said, his eye running down the typescript. "'Emperor's horses, Habsburg, an Irishman saved his life on the ramparts of Vienna. Don't you forget, Maximilian Carl O'Donnell, Graf von Tyrconnell in Ireland, sent his heir over to make the king an Austrian field-marshal now.' going to be trouble there one day. Wild geese. Oh, yes, every time. Don't you forget it. The moot point is, did he forget it? J. J. O'Molloy said quietly, turning a horseshoe paperweight. Saving princes is a thank-you job. Professor McHugh turned on him. And if not, he said. I'll tell you how it was, Miles Crawford began. A Hungarian it was one day. Lost causes. Noble Marquess mentioned. We were always loyal to lost causes, the professor said. Success for us is the death of the intellect and of the imagination. We were never loyal to the successful. We serve them. I teach the blatant Latin language. I speak the tongue of a race, the acme of whose mentality is the maxim, time is money. Material domination. Dominus, Lord, where's the spirituality? Lord Jesus, Lord Salisbury, a sofa and a West End club. But the Greek... Kyrie eleison. A smile of light brightened his dark-rimmed eyes, lengthened his long lips. The Greek, he said again, Kyrios, shining word, the vowels the Semite and the Saxon know not. 
Kyrie, the radiance of the intellect. I ought to profess Greek, the language of the mind. Kyrie eleison. The closet-maker and the cloaca-maker will never be lords of our spirit. We are liege subjects of the Catholic chivalry of Europe that foundered at Trafalgar and of the empire of the spirit, not an imperium that went under with the Athenian fleets at Egospotomy. Yes, yes, they went under. Pyrrhus, misled by an oracle, made a last attempt to retrieve the fortunes of Greece, loyal to a lost cause. He strode away from them towards the window. They went forth to battle, Mr. O'Madden Burke said gravely, but they always fell. Boo-hoo! Linehan wept with a little noise, owing to a brick received in the latter half of the matinee. Poor, poor, poor Pyrrhus! He whispered then near Stephen's ear. Linehan's limerick. There's a ponderous pundit McHugh, who wears goggles of ebony hue. As he mostly sees double, to wear them, why trouble? I can't see the Joe Miller, can you? In mourning for Sallust, Mulligan says, whose mother is beastly dead. Miles Crawford crammed the sheets into a side pocket. That'll be all right, he said. I'll read the rest after. That'll be all right. Lenehan extended his hands in protest. But my riddle, he said, what opera is like a railway line? Opera? Mr. O'Madden Burke's sphinx face re-riddled. Lenehan announced gladly. The Rose of Castile. See the wheeze? Rose of cast steel? Gee! He poked Mr. O'Madden Burke mildly in the spleen. Mr. O'Madden Burke fell back with grace on his umbrella, feigning a gasp. "'Help!' he sighed. "'I feel a strong weakness.' Lenehan, rising to tiptoe, fanned his face rapidly with the rustling tissues. The professor, returning by way of the files, swept his hand across Stevens and Mr. O'Madden Burke's loose ties. "'Paris, past and present,' he said. "'You look like communards.' "'Like fellows who had blown up the Bastille,' J. J. O'Molloy said, in quiet mockery. "'Or was it you shot the Lord Lieutenant of Finland between you? "'You look as though you had done the deed, General Bobrikoff. Omnium gatherum. We were only thinking about it, Stephen said. All the talents, Miles Crawford said. Law, the classics. The turf, Lenehan put in. Literature, the press. If Bloom were here, the professor said, the gentle art of advertisement. And Madame Bloom, Mr. O'Madame Burke added, the vocal muse, Dublin's prime favourite. Lenehan gave a loud cough. Ahem, he said, very softly. Oh, for a fresh of breath air. I caught a cold in the park. The gate was open. You can do it. The editor laid a nervous hand on Stephen's shoulder. I want you to write something for me, he said. Something with a bite in it. You can do it. I see it in your face. In the lexicon of youth. See it in your face. See it in your eye. Lazy, idle little schemer. Foot and mouth disease, the editor cried in scornful invective. Great nationalist meeting in Boris in Ossery. All balls, bulldozing the public. Give them something with a bite in it. Put us all into it, damn it, soul, father, son, and holy ghost, and Jakes McCarthy. We can all supply mental pabulum, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Stephen raised his eyes to the bold, unheeding stare. He wants you for the press gang, J. J. O'Molloy said. The Great Gallagher you can do it, Miles Crawford repeated, clenching his hand in emphasis. Wait a minute, we'll paralyze Europe, as Ignatius Gallagher used to say when he was on the Charon, doing billiard-making in the Clarence. Gallagher, that was a pressman for you. That was a pen. You know how he made his mark? I'll tell you, that was the smartest piece of journalism ever known. That was in 81, 6th of May, time of the Invincibles. Murder in the Phoenix Park, before you were born, I suppose. I'll show you. He pushed past them to the files. Look at here, he said, turning. The New York World cabled for a special. Remember that time? Professor McHugh nodded. New York World, the editor said, excitingly pushing back his straw hat. Where it took place. Tim Kelly, or Kavanaugh, I mean. Joe Brady and the rest of them. Where Skin the Goat drove the car. Whole route, you see? Skin the Goat, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Fitzharris. He has that cabman's shelter, they say, down there at Butt Bridge. Hollihan told me. You know Hollihan? Hop and carry one, is it? Miles Crawford said. And poor Gumley is down there, too, so he told me, minding stones for the corporation. A night watchman. Stephen turned in surprise. Gumley, he said. You don't say so. A friend of my father's, is it? Never mind Gumley, Miles Crawford cried angrily. Let Gumley mind the stones, see they don't run away. Look at here, what did Ignatius Gallagher do? I'll tell you. Inspiration of genius. Cabled right away. Have you weekly freeman of 17 March? Right, have you got that? He flung back pages of the files and stuck his finger on a point. Take page four, advertisement for Bransom's coffee, let us say. Have you got that? Right. The telephone whirred. 
a distant voice. "'I'll answer it,' the professor said, going. "'B is Parkgate. Good.' His finger leaped and struck point after point, vibrating. "'T is Vice Regal Lodge. C is where murder took place. K is Knockmaroon Gate.' The loose flesh of his neck shook like a cock's wattles. An ill-starched dicky jotted up, and with a rude gesture he thrust it back into his waistcoat. "'Hello. Evening telegraph here. Hello. Who's there? Yes. Yes.' F to P is the route Skin the Goat drove the car for an alibi. In Chicor, Round Town, Windy Arbor, Palmerston Park, Ranelagh. F A B P. Got that? X is Davy's public house in Upper Leeson Street. The professor came to the inner door. Bloom is at the telephone, he said. Tell him to go to hell, the editor said promptly. X is Davy's public house. See? Clever, very. Clever, Lenehan said. Very. Gave it to them on a hot plate, Miles Crawford said, the whole bloody history. Nightmare from which you will never awake. I saw it, the editor said proudly. I was present. Dick Adams, the best bloody corkman the Lord ever put the breath of life in, and myself. Lenehan bowed to a shape of air, announcing, Madam, I'm Adam, and Abel was I, ere I saw Elba. History, Miles Crawford cried. The old woman of Princess Street was there first. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth over that, out of an advertisement. Gregor Gray made the design for it. They gave him the leg up. Then Paddy Hooper worked Tepe, who took him on to the star. Now he's got in with Blumenfeld. That's press. That's talent. He was all their daddies. The father of scared journalism, Lenehan confirmed, and the brother-in-law of Chris Callanan. Hello, are you there? Yes, he's still here. Come across yourself. Where do you find a pressman like that now, eh? The editor cried. He flung the pages down. Clam Dever. Lenehan said to Mr. O'Maddenburg. "'Very smart,' Mr. O'Maddenburg said. Professor McHugh came from the inner office. "'Talking about the Invincibles,' he said, "'did you see that some hawkers were up before the recorder?' "'Oh, yes, yes,' J. J. Molloy said eagerly. "'Lady Dudley was walking home through the park "'to see all the trees that were blown down by the cyclone last year, "'and she thought she'd buy a view of Dublin. "'And it turned out to be a commemoration postcard "'of Joe Brady or Number One or Skin the Goat, "'right outside the Viceregal Lodge, imagine. "'They're only in the Hook and I department,' Miles Crawford said. "'Pshaw, press in the bar. "'Where have you a man now at the bar like those fellows, "'like Whiteside, like Isaac Butt, like Silvertund O'Hagan? "'Ah, bloody nonsense, only in the half-penny place.' His mouth continued to twitch unspeaking in nervous curls of disdain. Would any one wish that mouth for her kiss? How do you know? Why did you write it, then? Rhymes and Reasons Mouth, South. Is the mouth South some way? Or the South a mouth? Must be some. South, pout, out, shout, drouth. Rhymes. Two men dressed the same, looking the same, two by two. La tua pace, che parla ti piace. Ventrem che il vento, come fa si tace. He saw them three by three, approaching girls in green, in rose, in russet, entwining, per la perso in mauve, in purple, che la pacifica ora fiamma, gold of oriflame, de rimerar fe più ardenti. But I, old men, penitent, leaden-footed, under dark neath the night, mouth, south, tomb, womb. Speak up for yourself, Mr. O'Maddenburg said. Sufficient for the day. J. J. O'Molloy, smiling palely, took up the gauge. "'My dear Miles,' he said, flinging his cigarette aside, "'you put a false construction on my words. "'I hold no brief, as at present advised, "'for the third profession qua profession, "'but your cork legs are running away with you. "'Why not bring in Henry Grattan and Flood and Demosthenes and Edmund Burke? "'Ignatius Gallagher, we all know, in his Chapelizode boss, "'Harmsworth of the Farthing Press and his American cousin of the Bowery Gutter Sheet, "'not to mention Paddy Kelly's budget, Pew's occurrences, "'and our watchful friend the Skibberine Eagle.' Why bring in a master of forensic eloquence like Whiteside? Sufficient for the day is the newspaper thereof. Links with bygone days of yore. Grattan and Flood wrote for this very paper, the editor cried in his face. Irish volunteers, where are you now? Established 1763. Dr. Lucas, who have you now like Don Philpot Curran? Pshaw. Well, J. J. O'Molloy said, Bush K.C., for example. Bush? the editor said. Well, yes, Bush, yes. He has a strain of it in his blood. Kendall Bush, or, I mean, Seymour Bush. He would have been on the bench long ago, the professor said, only for... but no matter. J. J. O'Molloy turned to Stephen and said quietly and slowly, One of the most polished periods I think I ever listened to in my life fell from the lips of Seymour Bush. It was in that case of fratricide, the child-murder case. 
Bush defended him. And in the porches of mine ear did pour. By the way, how did he find that out? He died in his sleep, or the other story, beast with the two backs. What was that? the professor asked. Talia, Magistra Artium. He spoke on the law of evidence, J. J. O'Malloy said, of Roman justice as contrasted with the earlier Mosaic Code, the Lex Talionis, and he cited the Moses of Michelangelo in the Vatican. Ha! A few well-chosen words, Lenehan prefaced. Silence! Pause. J. J. O'Malloy took out his cigarette case. False law. Something quite ordinary. Messenger took out his matchbox thoughtfully and lit his cigar. I have often thought, since looking back over that strange time, that it was that small act, trivial in itself, that striking of the match, that determined the whole aftercourse of both our lives. A polished period. J. J. O'Molloy resumed, moulding his words. He said of it, that stony effigy in frozen music, horned and terrible, of the human form divine, that eternal symbol of wisdom and of prophecy, which, if aught that the imagination or the hand of sculptor has wrought in marble of soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live, deserves to live. His slim hand with a wave graced echo and fall. Fine, Miles Crawford said at once. The divine afflatus, Mr. O'Maddenburg said. You like it? J. J. O'Molloy asked Stephen. Stephen, his blood wooed by grace of language and gesture, blushed. He took a cigarette from the case. J. J. O'Molloy offered his case to Miles Crawford. Lenehan lit their cigarettes as before and took his trophy, saying, Much of us thank of us. A man of high morale. Professor McGinnis was speaking to me about you, J. J. O'Molloy said to Stephen. What do you think really of that hermetic crowd, the opal hush poets, A. E. the master mystic? The Blavatsky woman started it. She was a nice old bag of tricks. A.E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer that you came to him in the small hours of the morning to ask him about planes of consciousness. McGinnis thinks you must have been pulling A.E.'s leg. He is a man of the very highest morale, McGinnis. Speaking about me. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say about me? Don't ask. No, thanks, Professor McHugh said, waving the cigarette case aside. Wait a moment. Let me say one thing. The finest display of oratory I ever heard was a speech made by John F. Taylor at the College Historical Society. Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon, the present Lord Justice of Appeal, had spoken, and the paper under debate was an essay, new for those days, advocating the revival of the Irish tongue. He turned towards Mild Crawford and said, You know Gerald Fitzgibbon, then you can imagine the style of his discourse. He is sitting with Tim Healy, J. J. O'Molloy says, rumour has it, on the Trinity College Estates Commission. He is sitting with a sweet thing, Miles Crawford said, in a child's frock. Go on, well. It was the speech, mark you, the professor said, of a finished orator, full of courteous haughtiness and pouring in chastened diction, I will not say the vials of his wrath, but pouring the proud man's contumely on the new movement. It was then a new movement. We were weak, therefore worthless. He closed his long, thin lips an instant, but eager to be on, raised an outspanned hand to his spectacles, and with trembling thumb and ring-finger touching lightly the black rims, steadied them to a new focus. Impromptu In ferial tone he addressed J. J. O'Molloy. Taylor had come there, you must know, from a sick-bed. That he had prepared his speech I do not believe, for there was not even one shorthand writer in the hall. His dark, lean face had a growth of shaggy beard round it. He wore a loose white silk neckcloth, and altogether he looked, though he was not, a dying man. His gaze turned at once but slowly from J. J. O'Molloy's toward Stephen's face, and then bent at once to the ground, seeking. His unglazed linen collar appeared behind his bent head, soiled by his withering hair. Still seeking, he said. When Fitzgibbon's speech had ended, John F. Taylor rose to reply. Briefly, as well as I can bring them to mind, his words were these. He raised his head firmly. His eyes bethought themselves once more. Witless shellfish swam in the gross lenses to and fro, seeking outlet. He began. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, great was my admiration in listening to the remarks addressed to the youth of Ireland, a moment since, by my learned friend. It seemed to me that I had been transported into a country far away from this country, into an age remote from this age, that I stood in ancient Egypt, and that I was listening to the speech of some high priest of that land addressed to the youthful Moses. His listeners held their cigarettes poised to hear, their smokes ascending in frail stalks that flowered with his speech. And let our crooked smokes, 
Noble words coming. Look out. Could you try your hand at it yourself? And it seemed to me that I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest raised in a tone of like haughtiness and like pride. I heard his words, and their meaning was revealed to me. From the Fathers it was revealed to me that those things are good which yet are corrupted, which neither, if they were supremely good, nor unless they were good, could be corrupted. Ah, curse you, that's St. Augustine. Why will you Jews not accept our culture, our religion, and our language? You are a tribe of nomad herdsmen. We are a mighty people. You have no cities or wealth. Our cities are hives of humanity, and our galleys, trireme and quadrireme, laden with all manner merchandise, furrow the waters of the known globe. You have but emerged from primitive conditions. We have a literature, a priesthood, an age-long history and a polity. Nile, child, man, effigy. By the Nile bank the babe Marie's kneel, cradle of bulrushes, a man supple in combat, stone-horned, stone-bearded, heart of stone. You pray to a local and obscure idol. Our temples, majestic and mysterious, are the abodes of Isis and Osiris, of Horus and Amun-Ra, Yours serfdom, awe, and humbleness. Ours thunder and the sea. Israel is weak, and few are her children. Egypt is a host, and terrible are her arms. Vagrants and day-laborers are you called. The world trembles at our name. A dumb belch of hunger cleft his speech. He lifted his voice above it boldly. But, ladies and gentlemen, had the youthful Moses listened to and accepted that view of life, had he bowed his head and bowed his will and bowed his spirit before the arrogant admonition, he would never have brought the chosen people out of their house of bondage, nor followed the pillar of cloud by day. He would never have spoken with the Eternal amid lightnings on Sinai's mountain top, nor ever have come down with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance, and bearing in his arms the tables of the law, graven in the language of the outlaw. He ceased, and looked at them enjoying a silence. Ominous for him. J. J. O'Molloy said, not without regret, and yet he died without having entered the land of promise. A sudden at the moment, though from lingering illness often previously expectorated demise, Lenehan added, and with a great future behind him. The troop of bare feet was heard rushing along the hallway and pattering up the staircase. That is oratory, the professor said, uncontradicted. Gone with the wind, Hosts at Mulligmast and Terra of the Kings, miles of ears of porches, the tribune's words howled and scattered to the four winds, a people sheltered within his voice, dead noise, a cassock records of all that ever anywhere wherever was. Love and laud him, me no more. I have money. Gentlemen, Stephen said, as the next motion on the agenda paper, may I suggest that the House do now adjourn? You take my breath away. It is not, perchance, a French compliment, Mr. O'Madden Burke asked. "'Tis the hour, methinks, when the wine-jug, metaphorically speaking, is most grateful in ye ancient hostelry. "'That it be, and hereby, is resolutely resolved. "'All that are in favour say I,' Lenehan announced. "'The contrary, no. "'I declare it carried. "'To which particular boozing shed? "'My casting vote is Mooney's.' "'He led the way, admonishing, "'We will sternly refuse to partake of strong waters, will we not? "'Yes, we will not, by no manner of means.' Mr. O'Madden Burke, following close, said with an ally's lunge of his umbrella, "'Lay on, Macduff!' "'Chip off the old block,' the editor cried, clapping Stephen on the shoulder. "'Let us go. Where are those blasted keys?' He fumbled in his pocket, pulling out the crushed type-sheets. "'Foot and mouth. I know. That'll be all right. That'll go in. Where are they? That's all right.' He thrust the sheets back and went into the inner office. "'Let us hope.' J. J. O'Molloy, about to follow him in, said quietly to Stephen, "'I hope you will live to see it published. Miles, one moment.' He went into the inner office, closing the door behind him. "'Come along, Stephen,' the professor said. "'That is fine, isn't it? It has the prophetic vision. Fuit Ilium, the sack of windy Troy, kingdoms of this world. The masters of the Mediterranean are fellaheen to-day.' The first newsboy came pattering down the stairs at their heels, and rushed out into the street, yelling, "'Racing special!' Dublin, I have much, much to learn. They turned to the left along Abbey Street. I have a vision, too, Stephen said. Yes, the professor said, skipping to get into step. Crawford will follow. Another newsboy shot past them, yelling as he ran. Racing special. Dear dirty Dublin. Dubliners. Two Dublin vestals, Stephen said, elderly and pious, have lived fifty and fifty-three years in Fumbley's Lane. Where is that? the professor asked. 
"'Off black pits,' Stephen said. "'Damp night reeking of hungry dough. "'Against the wall, face glistering tallow under her fustian shawl. "'Frantic hearts, acasic records. "'Quicker, darlint. "'On now, dare it. Let there be life.' "'They went to see the views of Dublin from the top of Nelson's pillar. "'They save up three and ten pence in a red tin letter-box money-box. "'They shake out the threepenny bits and sixpences "'and coax out the pennies with the blade of a knife. Two and three in silver and one in seven in coppers. They put on their bonnets and best clothes and take their umbrellas for fear it may come to rain. Life on the Raw They buy one and four pennyworth of brawn and four slices of pan loaf at the North City dining rooms in Marlborough Street from Miss Kate Collins, proprietress. They purchase four and twenty ripe plums from a girl at the foot of Nelson's pillar to take off the thirst of the brawn. They give two threepenny bits to the gentleman at the turnstile and begin to waddle slowly up the winding staircase, grunting, encouraging each other, afraid of the dark, panting, one asking the other, have you the brawn, praising God and the Blessed Virgin, threatening to come down, peeping at the air-slits. Glory be to God, they had no idea it was that high. Their names are Anne Kearns and Florence McCabe. Anne Kearns has the lumbago, for which she rubs on lordis water, given her by a lady who got a bottleful from a passionist father. Florence McCabe takes a crabine and a bottle of double X for supper every Saturday. Antithesis, the professor said, nodding twice. Vestal virgins, I can see them. What's keeping our friend? He turned. A bevy of scampering newsboys rushed down the steps, scattering in all directions, yelling, their white papers fluttering. Hard after them, Miles Crawford appeared on the steps, his hat aureoling his scarlet face, talking with J. J. O'Malloy. Come along, the professor cried, waving his arm. He set off again to walk by Stephen's side. Return of Bloom Yes, he said, I see them. Mr. Bloom, breathless, caught in a whirl of wild newsboys near the offices of the Irish Catholic and Dublin Penny Journal, called, Mr. Crawford, a moment. Telegraph, racing special. What is it? Miles Crawford said, falling back a pace. A newsboy cried in Mr. Bloom's face, Terrible tragedy in Rathmines, a child bit by a bellows. Interview with the editor. Just this ad, Mr. Bloom said, pushing through towards the steps, puffing and taking the cutting from his pocket. I spoke with Mr. Keyes just now. He'll give a renewal for two months, he says, after he'll see. But he wants a par to call attention in the telegraph, too, the Saturday pink. And he wants it copied if it's not too late, I told Councillor Nanetti from the Kilkenny people. I can have access to it in the National Library. House of Keys, don't you see? His name is Keys. It's a play on the name, but he practically promised he'd give the renewal. But he wants just a little puff. What will I tell him, Mr. Crawford? Will you tell him he can kiss my arse? Miles Crawford said, throwing out his arm for emphasis. Tell him that straight from the stable. A bit nervy. Look out for squalls. All off for a drink, arm in arm. Lenehan's yachting cup on the cadge beyond. Usual blarney. Wonder, is that young Daedalus the moving spirit? has a good pair of boots on him to-day. Last time I saw him he had his heels on view. Been walking in muck somewhere, careless chap. What was he doing in Irish Town? Well, Mr. Bloom said, his eyes returning, if I can get the design I suppose it's worth a short par. He'd give the ad, I think. I'd tell him. K-M-R-I-A. He can kiss my royal Irish arse, Miles Crawford cried loudly over his shoulder. Any time he likes, tell him. While Mr. Bloom stood weighing the point and about to smile, he strode on jerkily. Raising the Wind Nulla bona, Jack, he said, raising his hand to his chin. I'm up to here. I've been through the hoop myself. I was looking for a fellow to back a bill for me no later than last week. Sorry, Jack, you must take the will for the deed, with a heart and a half if I could raise the wind anyhow. J. J. O'Malloy pulled a long face and walked on silently. They caught up on the others and walked abreast. When they have eaten the brawn and the bread and wiped their twenty fingers in the paper the bread was wrapped in, they go nearer to the railings. "'Something for you,' the professor explained to Miles Crawford. Two old Dublin women on the top of Nelson's pillar.' "'Some column. That's what Wadler once said.' "'That's new,' Miles Crawford said. "'That's copy. Out for the waxies, Dargo. Two old trickies, what?' "'But they are afraid the pillar will fall,' Stephen went on. "'They see the roofs and argue about where the different churches are.' Rathmine's Blue Dome, Adam and Eve's, St. Lawrence O'Toole's, but it makes them giddy to look, so they pull up their skirts. Those slightly rambunctious females. Easy all, Miles Crawford said. No poetic license. We're in the archdiocese here. And settled down on their striped petticoats, peering up at the statue of the one-handled adulterer. One-handled adulterer? 
the professor cried. I like that. I see the idea. I see what you mean. Dames donate Dublin sits speed pill. Velocitous aeroliths belief. It gives them a crick in their necks, Stephen said, and they are too tired to look up or down or to speak. They put the bag of plums between them and eat the plums out of it, one after another, wiping off with their handkerchiefs the plum juice that dribbles out of their mouths and splitting the plum stones slowly out between the railings. He gave a sudden loud young laugh as a close. Lenehan and Mr. O'Madden Burke, hearing, turned, beckoned, and led on across toward Mooney's. Finished, Miles Crawford said, so long as they do no worse. Sophist wallops haughty Helen square on proboscis, Spartans Nash Mullers, Ithacan's vow pen is champ. You remind me of Antisthenes, the professor said, a disciple of Gorgias the Sophist. It is said of him that none could tell if he were bitterer against others or against himself. He was the son of a noble and a bondwoman, and he wrote a book in which he took away the palm of beauty from Argive Helen and handed it to poor Penelope. Poor Penelope, Penelope Rich. They made ready to cross O'Connell Street. Hello there, Central. At various points along the eight lines, tramcars with motionless trolleys stood in their tracks, bound for or from Rathmines, Rathfarnham, Blackrock, Kingstown, and Dalkey, Sandymount Gring, Ringsend, and Sandymount Tower, Donnybrook, Palmerston Park, and Upper Rathmines, all still becalmed in short circuit. Hackney cars, cabs, delivery wagons, mail vans, private broughams, aerated mineral water floats with rattling crates of bottles, rattled, rolled, horse-drawn rapidly. What, and likewise where? But what do you call it? Miles Crawford asked. Where do they get the plums? Virgilian says pedagogue, sophomore plumps for old man Moses. Call it, wait, the professor said, opening his long lips to reflect. Call it, let me see, call it, Deus nobis haec otia fecit. No, Stephen said, I call it a piscocyte of Palestine, or the parable of the plums. I see, the professor said. He laughed richly. I see, he said again, with new pleasure, Moses and the Promised Land. We gave him that idea, he added to J. J. O'Molloy. Horatio is sinecure this fair June day. J. J. O'Molloy sent a weary sidelong glance toward the statue and held his peace. I see, the professor said. He halted on Sir John Gray's pavement island and peered aloft at Nelson through the meshes of his wry smile. Diminished digits prove too titillating for frisky frumps, and wimbles flow wangles, yet can you blame them? One-handled adulterer, he said, smiling grimly. That tickles me, I must say. Tickled the old ones, too, Miles Crawford said, if the God Almighty's truth was known. End of chapter 7「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February 2006. Ulysses by James Joyce Chapter 8 Part 1 Pineapple rock, lemon plat, butterscotch, a sugar-sticky girl shoveling scoopfuls of creams for a Christian brother, some school treat, bad for their tummies, lozenge and comfit manufacturer to His Majesty the King, God, save, our, sitting on his throne sucking red jujubes white, a somber Y.M.C.A. young man watchful among the warm, sweet fumes of Graham lemons placed a throwaway in a hand of Mr. Bloom. Heart-to-heart -heart talks. Blue... Me? No. Blood of the Lamb. His slow feet walked him riverward, reading, Are you saved? All are washed in the blood of the Lamb. God wants blood victim. Birth, hymen, martyr, war... Foundation of a building, sacrifice, kidney burnt offering, druids, altars. Elijah is coming. Dr. John Alexander Dowie, restorer of the church in Zion, is coming. Is coming, is coming, is coming, all heartily welcome. Paying game. Tory and Alexander last year. Polygamy. His wife will put the stopper on that. Where was that ad some Birmingham firm, the luminous crucifix? Our Saviour! Wake up in the dead of night and see him on the wall, hanging. 
Pepper's ghost idea. Iron nails ran in. Phosphorus it must be done with. If you leave a bit of codfish, for instance, I could see the bluey silver over it. Night I went down to the pantry in the kitchen. Don't like all the smells in it waiting to rush out. What was it she wanted? The Malaga raisins. Thinking of Spain, before Rudy was born. The phosphorescence, that bluey greeny. Very good for the brain. From Butler's Monument House corner he glanced along Bachelor's Walk. Daedalus's daughter there still, outside Dylan's auction rooms. Must be selling off some old furniture. Knew her eyes at once from the father. Lobbing about waiting for him. Home always breaks up when the mother goes. Fifteen children he had. Birth every year almost. That's in their theology, or the priest won't give the poor woman the confession, the absolution. Increase and multiply. Did you ever hear such an idea? Eat you out of house and home. No families themselves to feed. Living on the fat of the land. Their butteries and larders. I'd like to see them do the black fast Yom Kippur. Cross buns. One meal and a collation for fear he'd collapse on the altar. A housekeeper of one of those fellows, if you could pick it out of her. Never pick it out of her. Like getting L.S.D. out of him. Does himself well. No guests. All for number one. Watching his water. Bring your own bread and butter. His reverence. Mum's the word. Good Lord, that poor child's dress is in flitters. Underfed she looks, too. Potatoes and marge. Marge and potatoes. It's after they feel it. Proof of the pudding. Undermines the Constitution. As he set foot on O'Connell Bridge, a puffball of smoke plumed up from the parapet. Brewery barge with export stout. England. Sea air sours it, I heard. Be interesting some day. Get a pass through Hancock to see the brewery. Regular world in itself. Vats of porter wonderful. Rats get in, too. Drink themselves bloated as big as a collie floating. Dead drunk on the porter. Drink till they puke again like Christians. Imagine drinking that. Rats. Vats. Well, of course, if we knew all the things. Looking down, he saw, flapping strongly, wheeling between the gaunt quay walls, gulls. Rough weather outside. If I threw myself down. Reuben Jay's son must have swallowed a good bellyful of that sewage. One and eight pence too much. Hmm. It's the droll way he comes out with the things. Knows how to tell a story, too. They wheeled lower, looking for grub. Wait. He threw down among them a crumpled paper ball. Elijah, thirty-two feet per sec, is come. Not a bit. The ball bobbed unheeded on the wake of swells, floated under by the bridge piers. Not such damn fools. Also the day I threw that stale cake out of Aaron's king, picked it up in the wake fifty yards astern. Live by their wits. They wheeled, flapping. The hungry famished gull flaps o'er the water's dull. That is how poets write, the similar sounds. But then Shakespeare has no rhymes, blank verse. The flow of the language it is. The thoughts. Solemn. Hamlet, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain time to walk the earth. Two apples a penny, two for a penny. His gaze passed over the glazed apples, serried on her stand. Australians they must be this time of year. Shiny peels, polishes them up with a rag or a handkerchief. Wait, those poor birds. He halted again, and bought from the old apple woman two Banbury cakes for a penny, and broke the brittle paste and threw its fragments down into the liffy. See that? The gulls swooped silently, two, then all from their heights, pouncing on prey. Gone, every morsel. Aware of their greed and cunning, he shook the powdery crumb from his hands. They never expected that. Manna. Live on fish, fishy flesh they have. All seabirds, gulls, sea goose. Swans from Anna Liffey swim down here sometimes to preen themselves. No accounting for tastes. Wonder what kind is swan meat. Robinson Crusoe had to live on them. They wheeled, flapping weakly. I'm not going to throw any more. Penny quite enough. Lot of thanks I get, not even a caw. 
They spread foot and mouth disease, too. If you cram a turkey, say, on chestnut meal, it tastes like that. Eat pig like pig. But then why is it that saltwater fish are not salty? How is that? His eyes sought answer from the river, and saw a rowboat rock at anchor on the treacly swells lazily its plastered board. Kino's eleven. Trousers. Good idea, that. Wonder if he pays rent to the corporation. How can you own water, really? It's always flowing in a stream, never the same, which in the stream of life we trace, because life is a stream. All kinds of places are good for ads. That quack doctor for the clap used to be stuck up in all the greenhouses. Never see it now. Strictly confidential. Dr. High Franks. Didn't cost him a red like McGinney, the dancing master, self-advertisement. Got fellows to stick them up, or stick them up himself, for that matter, on the QT, running in to loosen a button. Fly by night. Just the place, too. Post no bills. Post a hundred and ten pills. Some chap with a dose burning him. If he... Oh! Eh? No. No. No, no, I don't believe it. He wouldn't, surely. No. No. Mr. Bloom moved forward, raising his troubled eyes. Think no more about that. After one. Time ball on the ballast office is down. Dunsink time. Fascinating little book, that is, of Sir Robert Ball's. Parallax. I never exactly understood. There's a priest. Could ask him. Pear. It's Greek. Parallel. Parallax. Met him pike hoses, she called it, till I told her about the transmigration. Oh, rocks! Mr. Bloom smiled, oh, rocks, at two windows of the ballast office. She's right, after all. Only big words for ordinary things on account of the sound. She's not exactly witty. Can be rude, too. Blurt out what I was thinking. Still, I don't know. She used to say Ben Dollard had a bass barrel-tone voice. He has legs like barrels, and you'd think he was singing into a barrel. Now, isn't that wit? They used to call him Big Ben. Not half as witty as calling him Bass Barrel Tone. Appetite like an albatross. Get outside of a baron of beef. Powerful man he was at stowing away number one base. Barrel of base. See? It all works out. A procession of white-smocked sandwichmen marched slowly towards him along the gutter. Scarlet sashes across their boards. Bargains. Like that priest they are this morning. We have sinned. We have suffered. He read the scarlet letters on their five tall white hats. H-E-L-Y-S. Wisdom Healy's. Why, lagging behind, drew a chunk of bread from under his foreboard, crammed it into his mouth, and munched as he walked. Our staple food. Three bob a day, walking along the gutters, street after street. Just keep skin and bone together, bread and skilly. They are not boil. No. M. Glade's men. Doesn't bring in any business, either. I suggested to him about a transport show-cart with two smart girls sitting inside, writing letters, copy-books, envelopes, blotting paper. I bet that would have caught on. Smart girls writing something catch the eye at once. Everyone dying to know what she's writing. Get twenty of them round you, if you stare at nothing. Have a finger in the pie. Women, too. Curiosity. Pillar of salt. Wouldn't have it, of course, because he didn't think of it himself first. Or the ink bottle I suggested with a false stain of black celluloid. His ideas for ads like plum trees potted under the obituaries. Cold meat department. You can't lick em. What? Our envelopes. Hello, Jones, where are you going? Can't stop, Robinson. I am hastening to purchase the only reliable ink eraser. Can sell. Sold by Healy's Limited, 85 Dame Street. Well, out of that ruck I am. Devil of a job it was collecting accounts of those convents. Tranquilla convent. That was a nice nun there, really sweet face. Wimple suited her small head. Sister? Sister. I am sure she was crossed in love by her eyes. Very hard to bargain with that sort of a woman. I disturbed her at her devotions that morning, but glad to communicate with the outside world. Our great day, she said. Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Sweet name, too. Carmel. She knew I. I think she knew, by the way, she. If she had married, she would have changed. 
I suppose they really were short of money. Fried everything in the best butter all the same. No lard for them. My heart's broke eating dripping. They like buttering themselves in and out. Molly tasting it, her veil up. Sister? Pat Claffy, the pawnbroker's daughter. It was a nun they say invented barbed wire. He crossed Westmoreland Street when apostrophe S had plodded by. Rover Cycle Shop. Those races are on today. How long ago is that? Year Phil Gilligan died. We were in Lombard Street West. Wait, was it Tom's? Got the job in Wisdom Healy's year we married. Six years. Ten years ago. Ninety-four he died, yes. That's right, the big fire at Arnott's. Val Dillon was Lord Mayor. The Glencree dinner. Alderman Robert O'Reilly emptying the port into his soup before the flag fell. Bob Bob, lapping it for the inner alderman. Couldn't hear what the band played. For what we have already received, may the Lord make us. Millie was a kitty then. Molly had that elephant-gray dress with the braided frogs. Man tailored with self-covered buttons. She didn't like it, because I sprained my ankle first day she wore choir picnic at the sugar loaf. As if that. Old Goodwin's tall hat done up with some sticky stuff. Flies picnic, too. Never put a dress on her back like it. Fitted her like a glove, shoulders and hips. Just beginning to plump it out well. Rabbit pie we had that day. People looking after her. Happy. Happier then. Snug little room, that was, with the red wallpaper. Dock rolls, one and ninepence a dozen. Millie's tubbing night. American soap I bought. Elder flower. Cozy smell of her bath water. Funny she looked, soaped all over. Shapely, too. Now photography. Poor Papa's daguerreotype atelier he told me of. Hereditary taste. He walked along the curbstone. Stream of life. What was the name of that priestly-looking chap who was always squinting in when he passed? Weak eyes, woman. Stopped in Citroen St. Kevin's Parade. Pen something. Pen Dennis? My memory is getting... Pen? Of course it's years ago. Noise of the trams, probably. Well, if he couldn't remember the day father's name, that he sees every day. Bartell Darcy was the tenor, just coming out then, seeing her home after practice. Conceited fellow, with his waxed-up mustache, gave her that song, Winds That Blow From The South. Windy night that was, I went to fetch her. There was that lodge meeting on about those lottery tickets after Goodwin's concert, in the supper-room, or oak-room, of the mansion-house. He and I behind. Sheet of her music blew out of my hand against the high school railings. Lucky it didn't. Thing like that spoils the effect of a night for her. Professor Goodwin linking her in front. Shaky on his pins, poor old sot. His farewell concerts. Positively last appearance on any stage. May be for months, and may be for never. Remember her laughing at the wind. Her blizzard collared up. Corner of Harcourt Road. Remember that gust? Brfoo! Blew up all her skirts and her boa nearly smothered old Goodwin. She did get flustered in the wind. Remember when we got home, raking up the fire, and frying up those pieces of lap of mutton for her supper, with the chutney sauce she liked, and the mulled rum. Could see her in the bedroom from the hearth, unclamping the busk of her stays. White. Swish and soft flop her stays made on the bed. Always warm from her. Always liked to let herself out. Sitting there, after till near two, taking out her hairpins. Millie tucked up in Betty House. Happy. Happy. That was the night. Oh, Mr. Bloom, how do you do? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Breen? No use complaining. How is Molly those times? Haven't seen her for ages. In the pink, Mr. Bloom said gaily. Millie has a position down in Mullinger, you know. Go away. Isn't that grand for her? Yes, in a photographer's there. Getting on like a house on fire. How are all your charges? All on the baker's list, Mrs. Breen said. How many has she? No other in sight. You're in black, I see. You have no... No, Mr. Bloom said. I have just come from a funeral. Going to crop up all day, I foresee. Who's dead when, and what did he die of? Turn up like a bad penny. Oh, dear me, Mrs. Breen said. 
I hope it wasn't any near relation. May as well get her sympathy. Dignum, Mr. Bloom said, an old friend of mine. He died quite suddenly, poor fellow. Heart trouble, I believe. Funeral was this morning. Your funeral's tomorrow while you're coming through the rye. Diddle, diddle, dum, dum, diddle, diddle. Sad to lose the old friends, Mrs. Breen's woman eyes said melancholily. Now that's quite enough about that. Just quietly. Husband. And your lord and master? Mrs. Breen turned up her two large eyes. Hasn't lost them anyhow. Oh, don't be talking, she said. He's a caution to rattlesnakes. He's in there now with his law books, finding out the law of libel. He has me heart scalded. Wait till I show you. Hot mock turtle vapor and steam of new-baked jam puffs, roly-poly, poured out from Harrison's. The heavy noon reek tickled the top of Mr. Bloom's gullet. Want to make good pastry, butter, best flour, demerara sugar, or they'd taste it with a hot tea. Or is it from her? A barefoot Arab stood over the grating, breathing in the fumes. Deaden the gnaw of hunger that way. Pleasure or pain, is it? Penny dinner. Knife and fork chained to the table. Opening her handbag, chipped leather, hat pin. Ought to have a guard on those things. Stick it in a chap's eye in the tram. Rummaging. Open. Money. Please take one. Devils if they lose sixpence. Raise cane. Husband barging. Where's the ten shillings I gave you on Monday? Are you feeding your little brother's family? Soiled handkerchief. Medicine bottle. Pastille that was fell. What is she... There must be a new moon out, she said. He's always bad, then. Do you know what he did last night? Her hands ceased to rummage. Her eyes fixed themselves on him, wide in alarm, yet smiling. What? Mr. Bloom asked. Let her speak. Look straight in her eyes. I believe you. Trust me. Woke me up in the night, she said. Dream he had a nightmare. Indiges. Said the ace of spades was walking up the stairs. The ace of spades, Mr. Bloom said. She took a folded postcard from her handbag. Read that, she said. He got it this morning. What is it? Mr. Bloom asked, taking the card. U.P.? U.P., up, she said. Someone taking a rise out of him. It's a great shame for them, whoever he is. Indeed it is, Mr. Bloom said. She took the card back, sighing. And now he's going round to Mr. Benton's office. He's going to take an action for ten thousand pounds, he says. She folded the card into her untidy bag and snapped the catch. Same blue serge dress she had two years ago, the nap bleaching. Seen its best days. Wispish hair over her ears, and that dowdy toque, three old grapes to take the harm out of it. Shabby genteel. She used to be a tasty dresser. Lines round her mouth. "'only a year or so older than Molly. "'See the eye that woman gave her passing. "'Cruel. The unfair sex. "'He looked still at her, holding back behind his look of his discontent. "'Pungent mock-turtle oxtail mulligatawny. "'I'm hungry, too. Flakes of pastry on the gusset of her dress. "'Daub of sugary flour stuck to her cheek. "'Rhubarb tart with liberal fillings. Rich fruit interior. "'Josie Powell, that was.' and Luke Doyle's long ago, Dolphin's Barn, The Charades, U, P, Up. Change the subject. Do you ever see anything of Mrs. Beaufoy? Mr. Bloom asked. Mina Purefoy? She said. Philip Beaufoy, I was thinking. Playgoers Club. Match him off and thinks of the master stroke. Did I pull the chain? Yes, the last act. Yes. I just called to ask on the way in, is she over it? She's in the lying-in hospital in Hollis Street. Dr. Horn got her in. She's three days bad now. Oh, Mr. Bloom said. I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, Mrs. Breen said. And a house full of kids at home. It's a very stiff berth, the nurse told me. Oh, Mr. Bloom said. His heavy, pitying gaze absorbed her news. His tongue clacked in compassion. Tch, tch. I'm sorry to hear that, he said. "'Poor thing, three days. That's terrible for her.' Mrs. Breen nodded. "'She was taken bad on the Tuesday.' Mr. Bloom touched her funny bone, gently, warning her. "'Mind, let this man pass.' 
A bony form strode along the curbstone from the river, staring with a rapt gaze into the sunlight, through a heavy-stringed glass. Tight as a skull-piece, a tiny hat gripped his head. From his arm, a folded dust-coat, a stick, and an umbrella dangled to his side. "'Watch him,' Mr. Bloom said. "'He always walks outside the lampposts. Watch.' "'Who is he, if it's a fair question?' Mrs. Breen asked. "'Is he Dotty?' "'His name is Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdell Farrell,' Mr. Bloom said, smiling. "'Watch.' "'He has enough of them,' she said. "'Dennis will be like that one of these days.' She broke off suddenly. "'There he is,' she said. "'I must go after him. "'Good-bye. Remember me to Molly, won't you?' "'I will,' Mr. Bloom said. He watched her dodge through passers towards the shop-fronts. Dennis Breen, in skimpy frock-coat and blue canvas shoes, shuffled out of Harrison's, hugging two heavy tomes to his ribs, blown in from the bay, like old times. He suffered her to overtake him without surprise, and thrust his dull gray beard towards her, his loose jaw wagging as he spoke earnestly. Meshuggah! Off his chump! Mr. Bloom walked on again easily, seeing ahead of him in sunlight the tight skull-piece, the dangling stick-umbrella dust-coat, going the two days. Watch him! Out he goes again, one way of getting on in the world, and that other old mosey lunatic in those duds. Hard time she must have with him. You, P, up. I'll take my oath, that's Alf Bergen, or Richie Golding. Wrote it for a lark in the Scotch house, I bet anything, round to Menton's office, his oyster eyes staring at the postcard. Be a feast for the gods. He passed the Irish Times. There might be other answers lying there like to answer them all. Good system for criminals. Code. At their lunch now. Clerk with the glasses there doesn't know me. Oh, leave them there to simmer. Enough bother wading through forty-four of them. Wanted. Smart lady typist to aid gentlemen in literary work. I called you naughty, darling, because I do not like that other world. Please tell me what is the meaning. Please tell me what perfume does your wife. Tell me who made the world. THE WAY THEY SPRING THOSE QUESTIONS ON YOU, AND THE OTHER ONE LIZZIE TWIG. MY LITERARY EFFORTS HAVE HAD THE GOOD FORTUNE TO MEET WITH THE APPROVAL OF THE EMINENT POET A. E., MR. G. O. RUSSELL. NO TIME TO DO HER HAIR DRINKING SLOPPY TEA WITH A BOOK OF POETRY. BEST PAPER BY LONG CHALKS FOR A SMALL AD. GOT THE PROVINCES NOW. COOK AND GENERAL EX CUISINE HOUSEMAID KEPT. Wanted live man for spirit counter. Resp girl, R.C., wishes to hear of post in fruit or pork shop. James Carlyle made that. Six and a half per cent dividend. Make a big deal on Coates' shares. Cocanny, cunning old Scotch hunks. All the toady news. Our gracious and popular viscerin. Bought the Irish field now. Lady Mountcashel has quite recovered after her confinement and rode out with the Ward Union stagehounds at the enlargement yesterday at Rathos. Uneatable fox. Pot hunters, too. Fear and Jack's juices make it tender enough for them. Riding astride. Sit her horse like a man. Weight carrying huntress. No side saddle or pillion for her. Not for Joe. First to the meat and in at the death. Strong as a brood mare, some of those horsey women. Swagger around livery stables. Toss off a glass of brandy neat, while you'd say knife. That one in the Grosvenor this morning. Up with her on the car, whish, whish. Stonewall or five-barred gate put her mount to it. Think that pug-nosed driver did it out of spite. Who is this she was like? Oh, yes, Mrs. Miriam Dandre that sold me her old wraps in black underclothes in the Shelbourne Hotel. "'Divorced Spanish-American. "'Didn't take a feather out of her my handling them, "'as if I was her clothes-horse. "'Saw her in the vice-regal party "'when Stubbs, the park ranger, "'got me in with Whalen of the Express, "'scavaging what the quality left. "'High tea. "'Mayonnaise I poured on the plums, "'thinking it was custard. "'Her ears ought to have tingled "'for a few weeks after. "'Want to be a bull for her. "'Born courtesan. "'No nursery work for her, thanks.' Poor Mrs. Purefoy, Methodist husband, method in his madness, saffron bun and milk and soda lunch in the educational dairy, Y. M. C. 
A. Eating with a stopwatch, thirty-two chews to the minute, and still his mutton-chop whiskers grew. Supposed to be well-connected. Theodore's cousin in Dublin Castle. One Tony relative in every family. Hardy annuals he presents her with. Saw him out at the three jolly topers, marching along bareheaded, and his eldest boy carrying one in a market-net. The squallers. Poor thing. Then having to give the breast year after year all hours of the night. Selfish those titis are. Dog in the manger. Only one lump of sugar in my tea, if you please. He stood at Fleet Street crossing. Luncheon interval. A sixpenny at Rose? Must look up that ad in the National Library. An eightpenny in the Burton. Better. On my way. He walked on past Bolton's Westmoreland house. Tea. 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 I forgot to tap Tom Kernan. S -t -t -t. Three days, imagine groaning on a bed with a vinegared handkerchief round her forehead, her belly swollen out. Phew! Dreadful, simply. Child's head too big, forceps. Doubled up inside her, trying to butt its way out blindly, groping for the way out. Kill me, that would. Lucky Molly got over hers lightly. They ought to invent something to stop that. Life with hard labor. Twilight sleep idea. Queen Victoria was given that. Nine she had. A good layer. Old woman that lived in a shoe, she had so many children. Suppose he was consumptive. Time someone thought about it instead of gassing about the what was it, the pensive bosom of the silver effligence. Flap doodle to feed fools on. They could easily have big establishments, whole thing quite painless out of all the taxes, give every child born five quid, at compound interest up to twenty-one five per cent, is a hundred shillings and five tiresome pounds, multiplied by twenty decimal system, encourage people to put by money, save hundred and ten, and a bit twenty-one years want to work it out on paper, come to a tidy sum more than you think. Not stillborn, of course. They are not even registered. Trouble for nothing. Funny sight, two of them together, their bellies out, Molly and Mrs. Moisel. Mother's meeting. Pathesis retires for the time being, then returns. How flat they look all of a sudden after. Peaceful eyes, weight off their mind. Old Mrs. Thornton was a jolly old soul. All my babies, she said. The spoon of pap in her mouth before she fed them. Oh, that's yum, yum, yum. Got her hand crushed by old Tom Wall, son. His first bow to the public. Head like a prize pumpkin. Snuffy Dr. Murrin. People knocking them up at all hours. For God's sake, doctor, wife in her throes. Then keep them waiting months for their fee. To attendance on your wife. No gratitude in people. Humane doctors, most of them. Before the huge high door of the Irish House of Parliament, a flock of pigeons flew. Their little frolic after meals. Who will we do it on? I pick the fellow in back. Here goes. Here's good luck. Must be thrilling from the air. Apjohn, myself, and Owen Goldberg up in the trees near Goose Green playing the monkeys. Mackerel, they called me. A squad of constables debouched from College Street, marching in Indian file. Goose step. Food heated faces. Sweating helmets patting their truncheons. After their feed with a good load of fat soup under their belts. Policeman's lot is off to happy one. They split up in groups and scattered, saluting towards their beats. Let out to graze. Best moment to attack one in pudding time. A punch in his dinner. A squad of others marching irregularly. Rounded Trinity railings making for the station. Bound for their troughs. Prepare to receive cavalry. Prepare to receive soup. He crossed under Tommy Moore's roguish finger. They did right to put him up over a urinal, meeting of the waters, Ought to be places for women. Running into cake shops. Settle my hat straight. There is not in this wide world a valley. Great song of Julia Morkins. Kept her voice up to the very last. Pupil of Michael Balfe's, wasn't she? He gazed after the last broad tunic. Nasty customers to tackle. Jack Bower could a tale unfold. Father a G man. If a fellow gave them trouble being lagged, they let him have it hot and heavy in the bridewell. Can't blame them, after all, with the job they have, especially the young hornies. That horse policeman, the day Joe Chamberlain was given his degree in Trinity, he got a run for his money, my word he did. 
his horse's hoofs clattering after us down Abbey Street. Lucky I had the presence of mind to dive into Manning's, or I was souped. He did come a wallop, by George. Must have cracked his skull on the cobblestones. I oughtn't to have got myself swept along with those medicals, and the Trinity jibs in their mortar-boards, looking for trouble. Still, I got to know that young Dixon who dressed that sting for me in the mater, and now he's in Hollis Street where Mrs. Purefoy. Wheels within wheels. Police whistle in my ears still. All skedaddled. Why he fixed on me. Give me in charge. Right here it began. Up the Boers. Three cheers for Dewet. We'll hang Joe Chamberlain on a sour apple tree. Silly billies. Mob of young cubs yelling their guts out. Vinegar Hill. The Butter Exchange Band. Few years time, half of them magistrates and civil servants. War comes on. Into the army, helter-skelter. Same fellows used to. Whether on the scaffold high. Never know who you're talking to. Corny Helleher, he has Harvey Duff in his eye. Like that Peter or Dennis or James Carey that blew the gaff on the Invincibles. Member of the corporation, too. Egging raw the youths on to get in the know, at the time drawing secret service pay from the castle. Drop him like a hot potato. Why those plain-clothes men are always courting slavies. Easily twig a man used to uniform. Square pushing up against a back door. Maul her a bit. Then the next thing on the menu. And who is the gentleman does be visiting there? Was the young master saying anything? Peeping Tom through the keyhole. Decoy duck. Hot-blooded young student fooling round her fat arms ironing. Are those yours, Mary? I don't wear such things. Stop, or I'll tell the missus on you. Out half the night. There are great times coming, Mary. Wait till you see. Ah, go along with your great times coming. Barmaids, too. Tobacco shop girls. James Stevens's idea was the best. He knew them. Circles of ten so that a fellow couldn't round on more than his own ring. Sin, fine. Back out, you. Get the knife. Hidden hand. Stay in. The firing squad. Turnkey's daughter got him out of Richmond, off from Lusk. Putting up in the Buckingham Palace Hotel under their very noses. Garibaldi. You must have a certain fascination. Parnell. Arthur Griffith is a square-headed fellow, but he has no go in him for the mob, or gas about our lovely land. Gammon and spinach. Dublin Bakery Company's Tea Room. Debating Societies. That republicanism is the best form of government— that the language question should take precedence of the economic question. Have your daughter inveigling them to your house. Stuff them up with meat and drink. Michaelmas goose. Here's a good lump of thyme seasoning under the apron for you. Have another quart of goose grease before it gets too cold. Half-fed enthusiasts. Penny roll and a walk with the band. No grace for the carver. The thought that the other chap pays best sauce in the world. Make themselves thoroughly at home. Show us over those apricots, meaning peaches, the not far distant day. Home rule sun rising in the northwest. His smile faded as he walked, a heavy cloud hiding the sun slowly, shadowing Trinity's surly front. Trams passed one another, ingoing, outgoing, clanging. Useless words. Things go on same day after day. Squads of police marching out, back. Trams in, out. Those two loonies mooching about. Dignam carted off. Mina Purefoy, swollen belly on a bed groaning to have a child tugged out of her. One born every second somewhere. Other dying every second. Since I fed the birds, five minutes. Three hundred kicked the bucket. Other three hundred born, washing the blood off. All are washed in the blood of the lamb. Bawling. Ma! City full passing away. Other city full coming, passing away too. Other coming on, passing on. Houses, lines of houses, streets, miles of pavements, piled up bricks, stones, changing hands. This owner that, landlord never dies, they say. Other steps into his shoes when he gets his notice to quit. They buy the place up with gold, and still they have all the gold. Swindle in it somewhere. Piled up in cities, worn away age after age. Pyramids in sand, built on bread and onions. Slaves, Chinese wall, Babylon, big stones left, 
round towers, rest rubble, sprawling suburbs, jerry-built, Kerwin's mushroom houses built of breeze, shelter for the night. No one is anything. This is the very worst hour of the day, vitality, dull, gloomy, hate this hour, feel as if I had been eaten and spewed. Provost's house, the Reverend Dr. Salmon, tinned salmon, well, tinned in there, like a mortuary chapel, wouldn't live in it if they paid me, hope they have liver and bacon today, nature abhors a vacuum. The sun freed itself slowly and lit glints of light among the silverware opposite in Walter Sexton's window, by which John Howard Parnell passed unseeing. There he is, the brother, image of him, haunting face. Now that's a coincidence. Course hundreds of times you think of a person, and don't meet him, like a man walking in his sleep. No one knows him. Must be a corporation meeting today. They say he never put on the city marshal's uniform since he got the job. Charlie Cavanaugh used to come out on his high horse, cocked hat, puffed, powdered, and shaved. Look at the woebegone walk of him. Eaten a bad egg. Poached eyes on a ghost. I have a pain. Great man's brother. His brother's brother. He'd look nice on the city charger. Drop into the D.B.C. probably for his coffee. Play chess there. His brother used men as pawns. Let them all go to pot. Afraid to pass a remark on him. Freeze them up with that eye of his. That's the fascination, the name. All a bit touched. Mad Fanny and his other sister, Mrs. Dickinson, driving about with scarlet harness. Bolt upright like Sir J. McArdle. Still David Sheehy beat him for South Meath. Apply for the Chiltern hundreds and retire into public life. The Patriot's Banquet. Eating orange peels in the park. Simon Daedalus said when they put him in Parliament that Parnell would come back from the grave and lead him out of the House of Commons by the arm. Of the two-headed octopus, one of whose heads is the head upon which the ends of the world have forgotten to come, while the other speaks with a Scotch accent, the tentacles, they pass from behind Mr. Bloom along the curbstone, beard and bicycle, young woman. And there he is, too. Now that's really a coincidence, second time. Coming events cast their shadows before. With the approval of the eminent poet, Mr. G. O. Russell, that might be Lizzie Twig with him. A. E. What does that mean? Initials, perhaps. Albert Edward, Arthur Edmund, Alphonsus Ebb Ed L. Esquire. What was he saying? The ends of the world with a Scotch accent. Tentacles. Octopus. Something occult. Symbolism. Holding forth. She's taking it all in, not saying a word. To aid gentlemen in literary work. His eyes followed the high figure in homespun, beard and bicycle, a listening woman at his side, coming from the vegetarian, only wedge bobbles and fruit. Don't eat a beefsteak. If you do, the eyes of the cow will pursue you through all eternity. They say it's healthier. Wind and watery, though. Tried it. Keep you on the run all day, bad as a bloater. Dreams all night. Why do they call that thing they gave me nutsteak? Nutarians, fruitarians to give you the idea you were eating rump steak. Absurd. Salty, too. They cook in soda, keep you sitting by the tap all night. Her stockings are loose over her ankles. I detest that, so tasteless. Those literary, ethereal people they are all. Dreamy, cloudy, symbolistic. Esthetes they are. I wouldn't be surprised if it was that kind of food you see produces the like waves of the brain, the poetical. For example, one of those policemen sweating Irish stew into their shirts. You couldn't squeeze a line of poetry out of him. Don't know what poetry is, even. Must be in a certain mood. The dreamy, cloudy gull waves o'er the waters dull. He crossed at Nassau Street corner and stood before the window of Yeats and Son, pricing the field glasses. Or will I drop into old Harris's and have a chat with young Sinclair? Well-mannered fellow, probably at his lunch. Must get those glasses of mine set right. Goers' lenses, six guineas. Germans making their way everywhere. Sell on easy terms to capture trade. Undercutting. Might chance on a pair in the railway, lost property office. 
"'astonishing the things which people leave behind them "'in trains and cloakrooms. "'What do they be thinking about? "'Women, too. Incredible. "'Last year, travelling to Ennis, "'had to pick up that farmer's daughter's bra "'and hand it to her at Limerick Junction. "'Unclaimed money, too. "'There's a little watch up there on the roof of the bank "'to test those glasses by.' His lids came down on the lower rims of his eye-rides. Can't see it. If you imagine it's there, you can almost see it. Can't see it. He faced about, and, standing between the awnings, held out his right hand at arm's length towards the sun. Wanted to try that often. Yes, completely. The tip of his little finger blotted out the sun's disk. Must be the focus where the rays cross. If I had black glasses. Interesting. There was a lot of talk about those sunspots when we were in Lombard Street West, looking up from the back garden. Terrific explosions they are. There will be a total eclipse this year, autumn sometime. Now that I come to think of it, that ball falls at Greenwich time. It's the clock is worked by an electric wire from Dunsink. Must go out there some first Saturday of the month. If I could get an introduction to Professor Jolie, or learn up something about his family— that would do, too. Man always feels complimented. Flattery where least expected. Nobleman, proud to be descended from some king's mistress, his foremother. Lay it on with a trowel. Cap in hand goes through the land. Now go in and blurt out what you know you're not to. What's parallax? Show this gentleman the door. Ah! His hand fell to his side again. Never know anything about it. Waste of time. Gas balls spinning about, crossing each other, passing. Same old ding dong always. Gas, then solid, then whirled, then cold, then dead shell drifting around, frozen rock like that pineapple rock. The moon. Must be a new moon out, she said. I believe there is. He went on by La Maison Claire. Wait, the full moon was the night we were Sunday fortnight, exactly. There is a new moon. "'waiting down by the tulka. "'Not bad for a fair view moon. "'She was humming. "'The young May moon she's beaming, love. "'He, other side of her. "'Elbow, arm. "'He. "'Glow-worms lay a lamp. "'Is gleaming, love. "'Touch. "'Fingers. "'Asking. "'Answer. "'Yes. "'Stop. "'Stop. "'If it was, it was. "'Must. "'Mr. Bloom, quick breathing, "'slowlier walking past Adam Court. "'With a keep-quiet relief, "'his eyes took note that this is the street here, "'middle of the day, "'of Bob Doran's bottle shoulders. "'On his annual bend, M. Coy said, "'They drink in order to say or do anything, "'or cherche la femme. "'Up in the comb, with chummies and street-walkers, "'and then the rest of the year, sober as a judge. "'Yes, thought so. "'Sloping into the empire. "'Gone.' Plain soda would do him good. Where Pat Kinsella had his harp theatre before Whitbread ran the Queen's. Broth of a boy. Dion Boki called business with his harvest moon face in a pokey bonnet. Three pretty maids from school. How time flies, eh? Showing long red pantaloons under his skirts. Drinkers, drinking, laughed, spluttering, their drink against their breath. More power, Pat. Coarse red, fun for drunkards, guffaw and smoke. Take off that white hat. His parboiled eyes. Where is he now? Beggar somewhere. The harp that once did starve us all. I was happier then. Or was that I? Or am I now I? Twenty-eight I was, she twenty-three. When we left Lombard Street West, something changed. Could never like it again after Rudy. Can't bring back time. "'like holding water in your hand. "'Would you go back to then? "'Just beginning then. "'Would you? "'Are you not happy in your home, "'you poor little naughty boy? "'Wants to sew on buttons for me. "'I must answer. "'Write it in the library.'" End of Part 1 of Chapter 8 of Ulysses This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in March 2006. Ulysses by James Joyce. 
Chapter 8, Part 2 Grafton Street, gay with housed awnings, lured his senses. Muslin prints, silk dames and dowagers, jingle of harnesses, hoof-thuds low-ringing in the baking causeway. Thick feet that woman has in the white stockings, hope the rain mucks them up on her. Country-bred chaw bacon, all the beef to the heels we're in, always gives a woman clumsy feet. Molly looks out of plum. He passed, dallying the windows of brown Thomas, silk mercers, cascades of ribbons, filmsy, flimsy china silks, a tilted urn poured from its mouth a flood of blood-hued poplin, lustrous blood. The Huguenots brought that here. La causa e santa, terra, terra. Great chorus that, terri, terra. Must be washed in rainwater, mire beer. Terra bum bum bum, pin cushions. I'm a long time threatening to buy one, sticking them all over the place. Needles and window curtains. He bared slightly his left forearm. Scrape, nearly gone. Not today, anyhow. Must go back for that lotion. For her birthday, perhaps. June, July, August, September 8th. Nearly three months off. Then she mightn't like it. Women won't pick up pins. Say it cuts low. Gleaming silks, petticoats on slim brass rails, rays of flat silk stockings. Useless to go back. Had to be. Tell me all. High voices, sun-warm silk, jingling harnesses, all for a woman, home and houses, silk webs, silver, rich fruits, spike, spicy from Jaffa. Agendeth Nateum. Wealth of the world, a warm human plumpness settled down on his brain, his brain yielded, perfume of embraces all him assailed, with hungered flesh obscurely he mutely craved to adore. Duke Street, here we are, must eat, the Burton, feel better then. He turned Combridge's corner, still pursued, jingling, hoof thuds, perfumed bodies, warm, full. All kissed, yielded, and deep summer fields tangled pressed grass in trickling hallways of tenements along sofas, creaking beds. Jack, love, darling, kiss me, Reggie, my boy, love. His heart astir, he pushed in the door of the Burton restaurant, stink gripping his trembling breath, pungent meat juice, slush of greens. See the animals feed. Men, men, men. Perched on high stools by the bar, hats shoved back at the tables, calling for more bread, no charge, swilling, wolfing, gobfuls of sloppy food, their eyes bulging, wiping wetted mustaches. A pallid, suet-faced young man polished his tumbler knife, fork and spoon with his napkin. New set of microbes. A man with an infant sauce-stained napkin tucked round him shovel it. "'shoveled gurgling soup down his gullet. "'A man spitting back on his plate, "'half-masticated gristle. "'Gums, no teeth to chew, chew, chew it. "'Chump, chomp from the grill, "'bolting to get it over, sad boozer's eyes, "'spitting off more than he can chew. "'Am I like that? "'See ourselves as others see us. "'Hungry man is an angry man. "'Working tooth and jaw. "'Don't! Oh, a bone!' That last pagan king of Ireland, Cormac, in the school poem, choked himself at Slutty, southward of the Boyne. Wonder what he was eating. Something galoptious. St. Patrick converted him to Christianity. Couldn't swallow it all, however. Roast beef and cabbage. Once do. Smells of men, his gorge rose. Spat in sawdust, Swedish, warmish cigarette smoke, reek of plug, spilt beer— Men's beery piss, the stale of ferment. Couldn't eat a morsel here. Fellow sharpening knife and fork to eat all before him. Old chap picking his tootles. Slight spasm, full chewing the cud. Before and after. Grace after meals. Look on this picture, then, on that. Scoffing up stew gravy with sopping sippets of bread. Look it off the plate, man. Get out of this. He gazed round the stooled and tabled eaters, tightening the wings of his nose. Two stouts here. One corned and cabbage. 
That fellow ramming a knife full of cabbage down as if his life depended on it. Good stroke. Give me the fidgets to look. Safer to eat from his three hands. Tear it limb from limb, second nature to him, born with a silver knife in his mouth. That's witty, I think. Or no, silver means born rich, born with a knife. But then the illusion is lost. An ill-girt server gathered sticky, clattering plates. Rock, the head bailiff, standing at the bar, blew the foamy crown from his tankard. Well up, it splashed yellow near his boot. A diner, knife and fork upright, elbows on table, ready for a second helping, stared towards, his, stared towards the food lift across his stained square of newspaper. Other chap telling him something with his mouth full. Sympathetic listener. Table talk. I munched hum mun do unchester monk on bunch day. Ha? Huh? Did you, Faith? Mr. Bloom raised two fingers doubtfully to his lips. His eyes said, Not here. Don't see him. Out. I hate dirty eaters. He backed towards the door. Get a light snack and Davy Burns. Stop gap. Keep me going. Had a good breakfast. Roast and mashed here. Pint of stout. Every fellow for his own tooth and nail. Gulp, grub, gulp, gob stuff. He came out into clear air and turned back towards Grafton Street. Eat or be eaten. Kill. Kill. Suppose that communal kitchen years to come, perhaps. All trotting down with porringers and tommy cans to be filled. Devour contents in the street. John Howard Parnell, example, the provost of Trinity. Every mother's son don't talk of your provost and provost of Trinity. Provost of Trinity, women and children, cabmen, priests, parsons, field marshals, archbishops. From Aylesbury Road, Clyde Road, Artisan's Dwellings, North Dublin Union, Lord Mayor in his gingerbread coach, Old Queen in a bath chair. My plate's empty. After you, with our incorporated drinking cup, like Sir Philip Crampton's fountain. Rub off the microbes with your handkerchief. Next chap rubs on a new patch with his. Father O'Flynn would make hairs of them all, have rows of all the, have rows all the same, all for number one. Children fighting for the scrapings of the pot, want a soup pot as big as the Phoenix Park, harpooning flitches and hind quarters out of it. Hate people all around you. City Arms Hotel, table d'hote, she called it. Soup, joint and sweet. Never know whose thoughts you're chewing. Then who'd wash up all the plates and forks? Might be all feeding on tabloids that time. Teeth getting worse and worse. After all, there's a lot in that vegetarian fine flavor of things from the earth. Garlic, of course, it stinks after Italian organ grinders. Crisp of onions, mushrooms, truffles. Pain to the animal, too. Pluck and draw fowl. Wretched brutes there at the cattle market, waiting for the pole-axe to split their skulls open. Moo! Poor trembling calves! Meh! Staggering bob! Bubble and squeak! Butcher's buckets wobbly lights! Give us that brisket off the hook! Plup! Raw head and bloody bones! Flayed, glass-eyed sheep hung from their haunches! Sheep snouts, bloody papered sniveling nose jam on sawdust, top and lashers going out. Don't maul them pieces, young one. Hot, fresh blood they prescribe for decline. Blood always needed, insidious. Lick it up, smoking hot, thick, sugary, famished ghosts. Ah, I'm hungry. He entered Davy Burns, moral pub. He doesn't chat. Stands a drink now and then. "'but in leap year once in four. "'Cashed a check for me once. "'What will I take now?' "'He drew his watch. "'Let me see. "'Shandy Gaff? "'Hello, Bloom,' Nosy Flynn said from his nook. "'Hello, Flynn. "'How's things? "'Tip-top. "'Let me see. "'I'll take a glass of burgundy and... "'Let me see. "'Sardines on the shelves. "'Almost taste them by looking. "'Sandwich?' Ham and his descendants, mustard and bread there. Potted meats. What is home without plum trees, potted meats? Incomplete. What a stupid ad. Under the obituary notices they stuck it. All up a plum tree. Dignum's potted meat. Cannibals, wood with lemon and rice. 
white missionary too salty, like pickled pork, expect the chief consumes the parts of honor. Ought to be tough from exercise, his wives in a row to watch the effect. There was a right royal old nigger who ate or something the somethings of the Reverend Mr. McTrigger. With it an abode of bliss. Lord knows what concoction. Calls, moldy tripes, windpipes, faked and minced up. Puzzle find the meat. Kosher. No meat and milk together. Hygiene that was what they call now. Yom Kippur, fast spring cleaning of inside. Peace and war depend on some fellow's digestion. Religions, Christmas turkeys and geese. Slaughter of innocents. Eat, drink, and be merry. Then casual wards full after. Heads bandaged. Cheese digests all but itself. Mighty cheese. Have you a cheese sandwich? Yes, sir. Like a few olives, too, if they had them. Italian, I prefer. Good glass of burgundy, take away that. Lubricate. A nice salad, cool as a cucumber. Tom Kerning can dress. Puts gusto into it. Pure olive oil. Millie served me that cutlet with a spring of pars with a sprig of parsley. Take one Spanish onion. God made food. The devil the cooks. Deviled crab. Wife well? Quite well, thanks. A cheese sandwich, then. Gorgonzola, have you? Yes, sir. Nosy Flynn sipped his grog. Doing, doing any singing these times? Look at his mouth. Could whistle in his own ear. Flap ears to match. Music. Knows as much about it as my coachman. Still better tell him does no harm. Free ad. She's engaged for a big tour end of this month. You may have heard, perhaps. No. Oh, that's the style. Who's getting it up? The curate served. How much is it? Seven D, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bloom cut his sandwich into slender strips. Mr. McTrigger, easier than the dreamy, creamy stuff. His five hundred wives had the time of their lives. Mustard, sir? Thank you. He studded under each lifted strip yellow blobs. Their lives. I have it. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Getting it up, he said. Well, it's like a company idea, you see. Part shares and part profits. Eh, hey, now I remember, Nosy Flynn said, putting his hand in his pocket to scratch his groin. Who is this was telling me? Isn't Blazes Boylan mixing up in it? A warm shock of air, heat of mustard, launched on Mr. Bloom's heart. He raised his eyes and met the stare of a bilious clock. Two. Pub clock, five minutes fast. Time going on. Hands moving. Two. Not yet. His midriff yearned then upward, sank within him, yearned more longly, longingly. Wine. He smells sipped the cordial juice, and, bidding his throat strongly to speed it, set his wine-glass delicately down. Yes, he said. He's the organizer, in point of fact. No fear, no brains. Nosy Flynn snuffled and scratched. Flea having a good square meal. He had a slice of luck, Jack Mooney was telling me, over that boxing match Myler Keogh won against that soldier in the Portobello barracks. By God, he had the little kipper down in the ca county Carlo, he was telling me. Hope that dewdrop doesn't come down into his glass. No, snuffled it up. For near a month, man, before it came off, sucking duck eggs by God till further orders. Keep him off the booze, see? Oh, by God, Blazes is a hairy chap. Davy Byrne came forward from the hind bar in tuck-stitched shirt sleeves, cleaning his lips with two wipes of his napkin. Herring's blush, whose smile upon each feature plays with such and such replete. Too much fat on the parsnips. And here's himself and pepper on him, Nosy Flynn said. Can you give us a good one for the gold cup? I'm off that, Mr. Flynn, Davy Byrne answered. I never put anything on a horse. You're right there, Nosy Flynn said. Mr. Bloom ate his strips of sandwich, fresh clean bread with relish of disgust pungent mustard, the feety savor of green cheese. Sip, sips of his wine soothed his palate. Not logwood, that. Tastes fuller this weather with the chill off. Nice quiet bar, 
Nice piece of wood in that counter. Nicely planed, like the way it curves there. I wouldn't do anything in not. I wouldn't do anything at all in that line, Davy Byrne said. It ruined many a man, the same horses. Vintner's sweepstake. License for the sale of beer, wine, and spirits for consumption on the premises. Heads I win, tails you lose. True for you, Nosy Flynn said. Unless you're in the know, there's no straight sport going now. Lenehan gets some good ones. He's giving a scepter today. Zinfandel's the favorite. Lord Howard de Walden's won at Epsom. Morney Cannon is riding him. I could have got seven to one against St. Amant a fortnight before. That so? Davy Burton said. He went towards the window and, taking up the petty cash book, scanned its pages. I could, faith, Nosy Flynn said, snuffling. That was a rare bit of horse flesh. St. Frusquin was her sire. She won in a thunderstorm. Rothschild's filly, with wading in her ears, blue jacket and yellow cap. Bad luck to Big Ben Dollard and his John O'Gaunt. He put me off it, eh? He drank resignedly from his tumbler, running his fingers down the flutes. Eh, he said, sighing. Mr. Bloom, champing standing, looked upon his sigh. Nosy numbskull. Will I tell him that horse Lenehan? He knows already. Better let him forget. Go and lose more. Fool and his money. Do drop coming down again. Cold nose he'd have kissing a woman. Still, they might like that. Prickly beards they like. Dogs cold noses. Old Mrs. Rorden with the rumbling stomach sky terrier in the City Arms Motel. Molly fondling him in her lap. Oh, the big doggy bow wow wowsy wowsy. Wine soaked and softened rolled pith of bread mustard a moment mawkish cheese. Nice wine it is. Taste it better because I'm not thirsty. Bath, of course, does that. Just a bite or two. Then about six o'clock I can. Six. Six. Time will be gone by then. She. Mild fire of wine kindled his veins. I wanted that badly. Felt so off color. His eyes unhungrily saw shelves of tins, sardines, gaudy lobster's claws, all the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with a pin, off trees, snails out of the ground the French eat, out of the sea with bait on a hook. Silly fish learn nothing in a thousand years. If you didn't know risky putting anything in your mouth. Poisonous berries, Johnny Majories, roundness you think good, gaudy color warns you off. One fellow told another, and so on. Try it on the dog first. Let on by the smell or the look. Tempting fruit. Ice cones. Cream. Instinct. Orange groves, for instance, need artificial irrigation. Blebature tross. Yes, but what about oysters? Unsightly, like a clot of phlegm. Filthy shells, devil to open them, too. Who found them out? Garbage, sewage they feed on, fizz and red bank oysters. Effect on the sexual. Aphrodis. He was in the red bank this morning. Was he oysters old fish at table? Perhaps he young flesh in bed? No June has no R, no oysters. But there are people like things high. Tainted game. Jugged hair. First catch your hair. Chinese eating eggs, fifty years old, blue and green again. Dinner of thirty courses, each dish harmless might mix inside. Idea for a poison mystery. That Archduke Leopold, was it no, yes, or was it Otto, one of those Habsburgs? Or who was it used to eat the scruff off his own head? Cheapest lunch in town. Of course, aristocrats, then the others copy to be in the fashion. Millie, too, rock oil and flour. Raw pastry, I like myself. Half the catch of oysters they throw back in the sea to keep up the price. Cheap. No one would buy. Caviar. Do the grand. Hawk and green glasses. Swell blowout. Lady this. Powdered bosom pearls. The elite. Creme de la creme. They want special dishes to pretend there. Hermit with a patter. Hermit with a platter of pulse keep down the stings of the flesh. Know me, come eat with me. Royal sturgeon, high sheriff, coffee, the butcher. Write to venisons of the forest from his ex. Send him back the half of a cow. 
spread I saw down in the master of the roll's kitchen area, white-hatted chef like a rabbi, combustible duck, curly cabbage a la duchesse de parme. Just as well to write it on the bill of fare so you can know what, you've e what you've eaten. Too many drugs spoil the broth. I know it myself. Dosing it with Edward's desiccated soup. Geese stuffed silly for them. Lobsters boiled alive. Do take some ptarmigan. Wouldn't mind being a waiter in a swell hotel. Tips, evening dress, half-naked ladies. May I tempt you to a little more filleted lemon sole, Miss Dubedat? Yes, do, bedad. And she did, bedad. Who cannot name, I expect, that? A Miss Dubedat lived in Kelleny, I remember. Du, de la French. Still, it's the same fish, perhaps, old Mickey Hanlon of Moore Street ripped his... Ripped the guts out of making money, hand over fist, finger, and fish's gills, can't write his name on a check, think he was painting the landscape with his mouth twisted. Moo a kill a a chita, ha, ignorant as a kish of brogues worth fifty thousand pounds, stuck on the pane, two flies buzzed, stuck. Glowing wine on his palate lingered, swallowed, crushing in the wine press grapes of burgundy. Sun's heat it is, seems to a secret touch telling me memory, touching his sense moistened remembered, hidden under wild ferns on houth below us bay sleeping sky, no sound, the sky. The bay purple by the lion's head, green by drumleck, yellow-green towards Sutton, fields of undersea, the lines, faint brown and grass buried cities, pillowed on my coat she had her hair, Earwigs in the heather scrub, my hand under her nape. You'll toss me all. Oh, wonder! Cool, soft with ointments, her hand touched me, caressed. Her eyes upon me did not turn away. Ravished over her I lay, full lips full open. Kissed her mouth. Yum! Softly she gave me in her mouth the seed cake, warm and chewed. Mawkish pulp her mouth had mumbled, sweet sour of her spittle. Joy, I ate it. Joy. Young life, her lips that gave me pouting. Soft, warm, sticky gum jelly lips. Flowers her eyes were. Take me, willing eyes. Pebbles fell, she lay still. A goat, no one. High on Ben Houth, rhododendrons, a nanny goat, walking shore-footed, dropping currents. Screened under ferns, she laughed, warm-folded. Wildly, I lay on her, kissed her. Eyes, her lips, her upstretched neck beating, woman's breasts full in her blouse of nuns veiling, fat nipples upright. Hot, I tongued her. She kissed me. I was kissed. All yielding, she tossed my hair. Kissed, she kissed me. Me, and me now. Stuck, the flies buzzed. His downcast eyes followed the silent veining of the oaken slab. Beauty, it curves. Curves are beauty. Shapely goddesses, Vino, Venus, Juno, curves the world admires. Can see them, library museum standing in the round hall. Naked goddesses. Aids to digestion. They don't care what a man looks. All to see. Never speaking. I mean to say to fellows like Flynn. Suppose she did Pygmalion in Galatia. What would she say first? Mortal, put you in your proper place. Quaffing nectar at mess with God's golden dishes all ambrosial. Not like a tanner lunch we have. Boiled mutton, carrots and turnips, bottles of allsop. Nectar, imagine it drinking electricity. God's food. Lovely forms of women, sculpted Junonian. Immortal lovely. And we stuffing food in one hole and out behind. Food, child, blood, dung, earth, food. Have to feed it like stoking an engine. They have, no, never looked. All look today. Keeper won't see. Bend down, let something drop, see if she... Dribbling a quiet message from his bladder came to go to do not to do there to do. 
A man and ready he drained his glass to the lees and walked. Two men, too, they gave themselves, manly conscience. Lay with men lovers, a youth enjoyed her, to the yard. With, when the sound of his boots had ceased, Davy Byrne said from his book, "'What is this he is? Isn't he in the insurance line?' "'He's out of that long ago,' Nosy Flynn said. "'He does canvassing for the freeman.' "'I know him well to see,' Davy Byrne said. "'Is he in trouble?' "'Trouble?' Nosy Flynn said. "'Not that I heard of. Why?' "'I noticed he was in mourning.' "'Was he?' Nosy Flynn says. "'So he was, Faith. I asked him how he was all at home. "'You're right, by God, so he was.' "'I never broached the subject.' David Byrne said he mainly, If I see a gentleman is in trouble that way, it only brings it up fresh in their minds. It's not the wife, anyhow, Nosy Flynn said. I met him the day before yesterday, and he, coming out of that Irish farm dairy John Wise Nolan's wife, has in Henry Street, with a jar of cream in his hand, taking it home to his better half. She's well nourished, I tell you. Plover's on toast. And is he doing the freeman? And is he doing for the freeman? David Byrne said. Nosy Flynn pursed his lips. He doesn't buy cream on the ads he picks up. You can make bacon of that. How so? Davy Byrne asked, coming from his book. Nosy Flynn made swift passages in the air with juggling fingers. He winked. He's in the craft, he said. Do you tell me so? David Byrne said. Very much so, Nosy Flynn said. Ancient, free, and accepted order. He's an excellent brother. Light, love, light, life, and love, by God. They give, him, they give him a leg up. I was told that by a... Well, I won't say who. Is that a fact? Oh, it's a fine order, Nosy Flynn said. They stick to you when you're down. I know a fellow was trying to get into it, but they're as close as damn it. By God, they did right to keep the woman out of it. David Byrne smiled, yawned, nodded all in one. Yuck! There was one woman, Nosy Flynn said, hid herself in a clock to find out what they do be doing. But be damned, they smelt her out and swore her in on the spot a master mason. That was one of the St. Lagers of Donorel. David Byrne, sated after his yawn, said with tear-washed eyes, And is that a fact? Decent quiet man he is. I often saw him in here. "'and I never once saw him, you know, over the line.' "'God Almighty couldn't make him drunk,' Nosy Flynn said firmly. "'Slips off when the fun gets too hot. "'Didn't you see him look at his watch? "'Ah, you weren't there. "'If you ask him to have a drink, first thing he does, "'he outs with his watch to see what he ought to imbibe. "'Declare to God he does.' "'There are some like that,' Davy Byrne says. "'He's a safe man, I'd say.' "'He's not too bad,' Nosy Flynn said, snuffling it up. He's been known to put his hand down to help a fellow. Give the, f give the devil his due. Oh, Bloom has his good points, but there's one thing he'll never do. His hand scrawled a dry pen signature beside his grog. I know, Davy Byrne said. Nothing in black and white, Nosy Flynn said. Patty Leonard and Bantam Lyons came in. Tom Rochford followed, frowning, a planing hand on his claret waistcoat. "'Day, Mr. Byrne.' "'Day, gentlemen.' They paused at the counter. "'Who's standing?' Patty Leonard asked. "'I'm sitting, anyhow,' Nosy Flynn answered. "'Well, what'll it be?' Patty Leonard asked. "'I'll take a stone ginger,' Bantam Lyon said. "'How much?' Patty Leonard cried. "'Since when, for God's sake? What's yours, Tom?' "'How was the main drainage?' Nosy Flynn asked, sipping. For answer, Tom Rochford pressed his hand to his breastbone and hiccuped. "'Would I trouble you for a glass of fresh water, Mr. Byrne?' he said. "'Certainly, sir.' Patty Leonard eyed his ailmates. "'Lord love a duck,' he said. "'Look at what I'm standing drinks to. Cold water and ginger pop. Two fellows that could suck whiskey off a sore leg. He has some bloody horse up his sleeve for the gold cup. A dead snip.' "'Zinfandel, is it?' Nosy Flynn asked. Tom Roachford split powder from a twisted paper into the water set before him. "'That cursed dyspepsia,' he said before drinking. "'Bread soda is very good,' Davy Byrne said. 
Tom Rochford nodded and drank. Is it Zinfandel? Say nothing, Bantam Lyons winked. I'm going to plunge five bob on my own. Tell us if you're worth your salt and be damned to you, Patty Leonard said. Who gave it to you? Mr. Bloom, on his way out, raising three fingers in greeting. So long, Nosey Flynn said. The others turned. That's the ma man that gave it to me, Bantam Lyons whispered. Psh! Patty Leonard said with scorn. Mr. Burns, sir, we'll take two of your small Jamesons after that, and a stone ginger, Davy Byrne added civilly. Eh, Patty Leonard said, a sucking bottle for the baby. Mr. Bloom walked towards Dawson Street. "'his tongue brushing his teeth smooth. "'Something green it would have to be, spinach, say. "'Then, with those rontgen rays, searchlight you could. "'At Duke Lane a ravenous terrier choked up a sick knuckly cud on the cobblestones "'and lapped it with new zest. "'Surfeit. "'Returned with thanks, having fully digested the contents. First sweet, then savory.' Mr. Bloom coasted warily. Ruminants, his second course. Their upper jaw they moved. Wonder if Tom Rutchford will do anything with that invention of his. Wasting time explaining it to Flynn's mouth. Lean people, long mouths. Ought to be a hall or a place where inventors could go in and invent free. Of course, then you'd have all the cranks pestering. He hummed, prolonging in solemn echo the closes of the bars. Don Giovanni, a sinartico, me invitasti. Feel better, Burgundy, good pick-me-up. Who distilled first? Some chap in the blues, Dutch courage. That Kilkenny people in the National Library now, I must. Bare, clean, closet tools waiting in the window of William Miller, plumber. Turn back his thoughts. They could, and watch it all the, all the way down, swallow a pin sometimes, come out of the ribs years after, tore around the body, changing biliary ducts, spleens, squirting liver gastric juices, gastric juice coils of intestines like pipes. But the poor buffer would have to stand all the time with his inside entrails on show. Science. Ah, can our teco. What does that teco mean? Tonight, perhaps. Don Giovanni, thou hast me invited to come to supper tonight. The rum, the rum-dum. Doesn't go properly. Keys. Two months if I get to Nanetti, too. That'll be two pounds. Ten, about two pounds. Eight. Three hinds owes me. Two, eleven. Prescott's dye works van over there. If I get Billy Prescott's ad, two, fifteen. Five guineas about. On the pig's back. Could buy one of those silk petticoats for Molly, color of her new garters. Today. Today. Not think. Tour the south, then. What about English watering places? Brighton, Margate, piers by moonlight, her voice floating out, those lovely seaside girls, against John Long's a drowsing loafer, lounged in heavy thought, gnawing a crusted knuckle. Handyman wants job, small wages, will eat anything. <coughs> Mr. Bloom turned at Gray's confectioner's window of unbought tarts and passed the Reverend Thomas... Connellan's bookstore. Why I left the Church of Rome, Bird's Nest. Women run him. They say they used to give pauper children soup to change to Protestants in the time of the potato blight. Society over the way Papa went, too, for the conversion of poor Jews. Same bait, why we left the Church of Rome. A blind stripling stood tapping the curbstone with a slender cane. No tram in sight, once to cross. "'Do you want to cross?' Mr. Bloom asked. The, the blind stripling did not answer. His wall face frowned weakly. He moved his head uncertainly. "'You're in Dawson Street,' Mr. Bloom said. "'Molesworth Street is opposite. Do you want to cross? There's nothing in the way.' The cane moved out trembling to the left. Mr. Bloom's eye followed its line and saw again the dye works van drawn up before Drago's, where I saw his... Brilliantined hair, just when I was, horse drooping, driver in John Long's, slicking his droth. There's a van there, Mr. Bloom said, but it's not moving. I'll see you across. Do you want to go to the Molesworth Street? Yes, the stripling answered. 
South Frederick Street. Come, Mr. Bloom said. He touched the thin elbow gently, then took the limp, seeing hands to guide it forward. Say something to him. Better not do the condescending. They mistrust what you tell them. Pass a common r remark. The rain kept off. No answer. Stains on his coat. Slobbers his food, I suppose. Tastes all different for him. Have to be spoon-fed first. Like a child's hand, his hand, like Milly's was. Sensitive. Sizing me up, I dare say, from my hand. Wonder if he has a name. Van, keep his cane clear, clear of the horse's legs. Tired drudge, get his doze. That's right, clear. Behind a bull, in front of a horse. Thanks, sir. Knows I'm a man. Voice. Right now? First turn to the left. The blind stripling tapped the curbstone and went on his way, drawing his cane back, feeling again. Mr. Bloom walked behind the eyeless feet, a flat-cut suit of herringbone tweed. Poor young fellow! How on earth did he know that van was there? Must have felt it. See things in their forehead, perhaps. Kind of sense of volume. Weight or size of it. Something blacker than the dark. Wonder what he... Wonder would he feel it if something was removed? Feel a gap? Queer idea of Dublin he must have, tapping his way round by the stones. Could he walk in a bee-line if he hadn't that cane? Bloodless, pious face like a fellow going in to be a priest. Penrose, that was the chap's name. Look at all the things they can learn to do. Read with their fingers. Tune pianos. Or we are surprised they have any brains. Why we think a deformed person or a hunchback clever, if he says something we might say? Of course the other senses are more. Embroider. Plate baskets. People ought to help. Work basket I could buy for Molly's birthday. Hates sewing. Might take an objection. Dark men, they call them. Sense of smell must be stronger, too. Smells on all sides bunched together. Each street, different smell. Each person, too. Then the spring, the summer, smells. Tastes? They say you can't taste wines with your eyes shut or a cold in the head. Also smoke in the dark, they say, get no pleasure. And with a woman, for instance, more shame not seeing. And with a woman, for instance, more shameless not seeing. That girl passing the Stewart Institution, head in the air. Look at me, I have them all on. Must be strange not to see her. Kind of a form in his mind's eye. The voice, temperatures, when he touches her with his fingers, must almost see the lines, the curves. His hands on her hair, for instance. Say it was black, for instance. Good, we call it black. Then passing over her white skin. Different feel, perhaps. Feeling of white. Post office. Must answer. Fag today. Send her a postal order, two shillings, half a crown. Accept my little present. Stationer's just here, too. Wait, think it over. With a gentle finger, he felt ever so slowly the hair combed back above his ears. Again. Fibers of fine, fine straw. Then gently his finger felt the skin of his right cheek. Downy hair there, too. Not smooth enough. The belly is the smoothest. No one about. There he goes into Frederick Street. Perhaps to Levinston's dancing academy piano. Might be settling my braces. Walking by Doran's public house, he slid his hand between his waistcoat and trousers and, pulling aside his shirt gently, felt a slack fold of his belly. But I know it's whitey yellow. Want to try in the dark to see. He withdrew his hand and pulled his dress too. Poor fellow! Quite a boy! Terrible, really terrible! What dreams would he have, not seeing? Life, a dream for him. Where is the justice being born that way? All those women and children, excursion, bean-fest, burned and drowned in New York, holocaust, karma, they call that transmigration for sins you did in a past life, the reincarnation met him pike hoses. Dear, dear, dear. Pity, of course, but somehow you can't cotton on to them some way. Sir Frederick Falconer, going into the Freemasons' Hall. Solemn is Troy. 
after his good lunch in Earlsfort Terrace, old legal cronies cracking a magnum, tales of the bench and assizes and annals of the blue coat school. I sentenced him to ten years. I suppose he'd turn his nose up at that stuff I drank. Vintage wine for them, the year marked on a dusty bottle. Has his own ideas of justice in the recorder's court. Well-meaning old man. Police charge sheets crammed with cases get their percentage manufacturing crime. Sends them to the right about. The devil on money lenders. Gave Reuben J. a great straw calling. Now he's really what they call a dirty Jew. Power those judges have. Crusty old topers and wigs. Bear with a sore paw. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Hello, placard. Myrus Bazaar. His Excellency the Lord Lieutenant, 16th. Today it is, in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital. The Messiah was first given for that. Yes, Handel. What about going out there, Ballsbridge, drop in on keys? No use sticking to him like a leech. Wear out my welcome. Sure to know someone on the gate. Mr. Bloom came to Kildare Street. First, I must. Library. Straw hat in sunlight, tan shoes, turned up trousers. It is. It is. His heart quapped softly. To the right, museum, goddesses. He swerved to the right. Is it? Almost certain. Won't look. Wine in my face. Why did I? Too heady. Yes, it is. The walk. Not see. Get on. Making for the museum gate with long, windy steps, he lifted his eyes. Handsome building. Sir Thomas Dean designed. Not following me? N <clears throat> Didn't see me, perhaps. Light in his eyes. The flutter of his breath came forth in short sighs. Quick. Cold statues. Quiet there. Safe in a minute. No, didn't see me. After two, just at the gate. My heart. His eyes, beating, looked steadfastly at cream curves of stone. Sir Thomas Dean was the Greek architecture. Look for something, I. His hasty hand went quick into a pocket, took out red, unfolded Agendeth Nataeum. Where did I? Busy looking. He thrust back quick Agendath. Afternoon, she said. I am looking for that. Yes, that. Try all pockets. Hanker. Freeman. Where did I? Ah, yes. Trousers. Potato. Purse. Where? Hurry, walk quietly. Moment more. My heart. His hand looking for the where did I put found in his hip pocket. Soap lotion have to call tepid paper stuck. Ah, soap. There I... Yes. Gate. Safe. End of chapter 8 Ulysses by James Joyce, Section 9. A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Hugh McGuire, Michael Hind, Amanda Blythe, Colin Robertson, Wilson Blake, Christine Myers, Andrew Skinner, Mike Trevino, Jean Francois Rondeau. Urbane, to comfort them, the Quaker librarian purred. And we have, have we not, those priceless pages of Wilhelm Meister, a great poet on a great brother poet, a hesitating soul taking arms against a sea of troubles torn by conflicting doubts as one sees in real life. He came a step, a sink pace forward, on a neat's leather creaking and a step backwards, a sink pace on the solemn floor, a noiseless attendant, setting open the door but slightly, 
made him a noiseless beck. Directly, said he, creaking to go, albeit lingering, the beautiful, ineffectual dreamer who comes to grief against hard facts, one always feels that Goethe's judgments are so true, true in the larger analysis. Twice creakingly analysis, he corantoed off, bald, most zealous by the door, he gave his large ear all to the attendant's words, heard them, and was gone, two left. Monsieur de la Palisse, Stephen sneered, was alive fifteen minutes before his death. Have you found those six brave medicals, John Eglinton asked with elder's gall, to write Paradise Lost at your dictation? The sorrows of Satan, he calls it. Smile, smile, Cranley, smile. First he tickled her, then he patted her, then he passed the female catheter, for he was a medical jolly old Modi. I feel you would need one more for Hamlet. Seven is dear to the mystic mind, the shining seven, W.B. calls them. Glitter-eyed, his rufous skull close to his green cap desk lamp sought the face, bearded amid dark greener shadow, and Olé, holy-eyed, he laughed low, a Caesar's laugh of Trinity, unanswered. Orchestral Satan weeping many a road, tears such as angels weep. Ed elgi avia del cul fato trombetta. He holds my follies hostage. Cranley's eleven true wickle-low women to free their sireland. Gap-toothed Kathleen her four beautiful green fields, the stranger in her house, and one more to hail him. Ave Rabbi. The Tinahi Twelve. In the shadow of the glen he cooies for them. My soul, youth, I gave him night by night. God speed, God hunting. Mulligan has my telegram. Folly, persist. Our young Irish bards, John Eglinton has censured, have yet to create a figure which the world will set beside Saxon Shakespeare's Hamlet, though I admire him as old Ben did on this side idolatry. All these questions are purely academic, Russell oracled out of the shadow. I mean whether Hamlet is Shakespeare or James I or Essex, clergyman's discussions in the historicity of Jesus. Art has to r reveal to us ideas, formless spiritual essences. The supreme question about a work of art is out of how deep a life does it spring. The painting of Gustave Moreau is a painting of ideas. The deepest poetry of Shelley, the words of Hamlet, bring our mind into contact with the eternal wisdom. Plato's world of ideas, all the rest is the speculation of schoolboys for schoolboys. A.E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer, while tarnation strike me. The schoolmen were schoolboys first, Stephen said super politely. Aristotle was once Plato's schoolboy and has remained so. One should hope, John Eglinton sedately said. One can see him, a model schoolboy, with his diploma under his arm. He laughed again at the now smiling bearded face, formless, spiritual, father, word, and holy breath. All father, the heavenly man, Hesios Christos, magician of the beautiful, the logos who suffers in us at every moment. This verily is that, I am fire upon the altar. I am the sacrificial butter. Dunlop, judge, the noblest Roman of them all. A.E., Arvel, the name in ineffable. In heaven height, K.H., their master, whose identity is no secret to adepts. Brothers of the great white lodge, always watching to see if they can help. The Christ with the bride sister, moisture of light, born of an ensouled virgin, repentant Sophia, departed to the plate of Buddhi. The life esoteric is not for ordinary person. O.P. must work off bad karma first, Mrs. Cooper Oakley once glimpsed. Our very illustrious sister, H.P.B.'s elemental. O oh, fie, out, unt, pufightful, you notent look, Mrs. So you notent when a lady's showing off her elemental. Mr. Best entered tall, young, 
mild, light. He bore in his hand with grace a notebook, new, large, clean, bright. That model schoolboy, Stephen said, would find Hamlet's musings about the afterlife of his princely soul, the improbable, insignificant, and undramatic monologue as shallow as Plato's. John Eglinton, frowning, said, waxing wroth, Upon my word, it makes my blood boil to hear anybody compare Aristotle with Plato. Which of the two, Stephen asked, would have banished me from his commonwealth? Unsheath your dagger definitions. Horseness is the wetness of all horse. Streams of tendency and eons they worship. God, noise in the street, very peripatetic. Space, what you damn well have to see. Through spaces smaller than red globules of man's blood, they creepy crawl after Blake's buttocks into eternity, of which this vegetable world is but a shadow. Hold to the now, the here, through which all future plunges to the past. Mr. Best came forward, amiable towards his colleague. Haynes is gone, he said. Is he? I was showing him Jubainville's book. He's quite enthusiastic, don't you know, about Hyde's love songs of Connaught. I couldn't bring him to hear the discussion. He's gone to Gill's to buy it. Bound thee forth my booklet quick to greet the callous public, writ, I ween, twas not my wish, in lean, unlovely English. The peat smoke's, the peat smoke's going to his head, John Eglinton opined. We feel in England, pertinent thief, gone. I smoked his backy, green twinkling stone, an emerald set in the ring of the sea. People do not know how dangerous love songs can be, the auric egg of Russell warned occultly. The movements which work revolutions in the world are born out of the dreams and visions in the peasant's heart of the hillside. For them, the earth is not an exploitable ground, but the living mother. The rarefied egg of the academy and the arena produced the six-shilling novel, the music hall song. France produces the finest flower of corruption in Malarmé, but the desirable life is revealed only to the poor of heart, the life of Homer's Phaeacians. From these words, Mr. Best turned an offending face to, unoffending face to Stephen. Mallarmé, don't you know, he said, has written these wonderful prose poems Stephen McKenna used to read to me in Paris. The one about Hamlet, he says, Il se promène, lisant, au livre de lui-même. Don't you know, reading the book of himself. He describes Hamlet given in a French town, don't you know, a, a provincial town. They advertised it. His free hand graciously wrote tiny signs in the air. Hamlet ou le distrait, pièce de Shakespeare. He repeated it to John Eglinton's new-gathered frown. Pièce de Shakespeare. Don't you know, it's, it's so French, the, the French point of view. Hamlet ou the absent-minded beggar, Stephen ended. John Eglinton laughed. Yes, I suppose it would be, he said. Excellent people, no doubt, but distressingly short-sighted in some manners. Matters. Sumptuous and stagnant exaggeration of murder. A deathsman of the soul, Robert Greene called him. Stephen said. Not for nothing was he a butcher's son, wielding the sledded pole-axe and splitting in his, spitting in his palm. Nine lives are taken off for his father's one, our father who art in purgatory. Khaki hamlets don't hesitate to shoot. The blood-bolted shambles in Act Five is a forecast of the concentration camp sung by Mr. Swinburne. Cannily, I, his mute orderly, followed battles from afar. Whelps and dams of murderous foes whom none but he had spared. Between the Saxon smile and Yankee whelp, the devil in the deep sea. We will have it that Shakespeare is a ghost story, John Eglinton said for the Mr. Best's behoof. Like the fat boy in Pickwick, he wants to make our flesh creep. List, list, oh list. 
My flesh hears him creeping, hears, if thou didst ever. What is a ghost, Stephen said with tingling energy? One who has faded into impalpability through death, through absence, through change of manners. Elizabeth in London lay as far from Stratford as corrupt Paris lies from virgin Dublin. Who is the ghost from limbo partum, patrum, returned to the world that has forgotten him? Who is King Hamlet? John Eglinton shifted his spare body, leaning back to judge, lifted. It is this hour of the day in mid-June, Stephen said, begging with a swift glance their hearing. The flag is up on the playhouse by the bankside. The bear Sackerson growls in the pit near it, Paris Garden. Canvas climbers who sailed with Drake chew their sausages among the groundlings. Local color. Work in all you know. Make them accomplices. Shakespeare has left the Huguenot's house in Silver Street and walks by the Swan Mews along the riverbank, but he does not stay to feed the pen, chivying her game with signets toward the rushes. The Swan of Avalon has other thoughts. Composition of place. Ignatius Loyola, make haste to help me. The play begins. A player comes on under the shadow, made up of the cast-off male of a court buck, a well-set man with a bass voice. It is the ghost, the king, a king and no king, the, and the player is Shakespeare, who has studied Hamlet all the years of his life, which were not vanity, in order to play the part of the specter. He speaks the word to Burbage, the young player who stands before him, beyond the rack of Sarah calling him by name. Hamlet, I am thy father's spirit, but bidding him to list. To a son he speaks, the son of the soul, the prince, young Hamlet, and to the son of his body, Hamnet. Shakespeare, who has died in Stratford, that his namesake may live on forever. Is it possible that the player Shakespeare, a ghost by absence, and in the vesture of buried Denmark, a ghost by death, speaking his own words to his own son's name, had Hamnet Shakespeare lived, he would have been the Prince Hamlet's twin? Is it possible, I want to know, or probable, that he did not draw or foresee the logical conclusion of those pre premises? You are the disposed son, dispossessed son. I am the murdered father. Your mother is the guilty queen. And Shakespeare, born Hathaway? But this prying into the family life of a great man, Russell began impatiently. Art thou there, True Penny? Interesting only to the Paris clerk. I mean, we have the plays. I mean, we, we read the poetry of King Lear. What is, this, what is it to know how the poet lived? As for living, our servants can do that for us. Villiers de Lille has said, peeping and prying into the green room gossip of the day, the poet's thinking, the poet's debts, we have King Lear, and it is immortal. Mr. Best's face appealed to, agreed. Sirrah, that pound he lent you when you were hungry? Mary, I wanted it. Take thou this noble. Go to. You spent most of it in Georgina Johnson's bed, clergyman's daughter, agonbite of inwit. Do you intend to pay it back? Oh, yes. When? Now? Well, no. When then? I paid my way. I paid my way. Steady on. He's from Ben Bayant Boyne Water, the northeast corner. You owe it. Wait. Five months. Molecules all change. I'm other. I now. Other. I got pound. Buzz. Buzz. But I, Entelechy, form of forms, Am I by memory because under ever-changing forms, I that sinned and prayed and fasted, a child con me saved from pandies, I and I, I, A-E-I-O-U. Do you mean to fly in the face of the tradition of three centuries? 
John Eglinton's carping voice asked. Her ghost, at least, has been laid forever. She died, for literature at least, before she was born. She died, Stephen retorted, 67 years after she was born. She saw him into and out of the world. She took his first embraces. She bore his children, and she laid pennies on his eyes to keep his eyelids closed when he lay on his deathbed. Mother's deathbed, candle, the sheeted mirror. Who brought me into this world lies there, bronze-lidded, under few cheap flowers. Liliata rutilantium. I wept alone. John Eglinton looked in the tangled glowworm of his lamp. The world believes that Shakespeare made a mistake, he said, and got out of it as quickly and as best he could. Bosh, Stephen said rudely. A man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. Portals of discovery open to let in the Quaker librarian, soft, creek-footed, bald, eared and assiduous a shrew john eglinton said shrewdly is not a useful portal of discovery one should imagine what useful discovery did socrates learn from xanthippe dialectic stephen answered and from his mother how to bring thoughts into the world what he learnt from his other wife myrto absit nomen Socratidonians, Epipsychidian, no man, not a woman, will ever know. But neither the midwife's lore nor the caudal lectures saved him from the archons of Sinn Fein and their noggin of hemlock. But Anne Hathaway, Mr. Best's voice said forgetfully, yes, we seem to be forgetting here as Shakespeare himself forgot her. His look went from brooder's beard to carper's skull to remind, to chide them not unkindly, then to the bald, pink, lollard, costard, guiltless, though maligned. He had a good groat's worth of wit, Stephen said, and no truant memory. He carried a memory in his wallet as he trudged to Romeville, whistling, The Girl I Left Behind Me. If the earthquake did not time it, we should know where to place poor Watt, sitting in his form, the cry of hounds, the studded bridle, and her blue windows. That memory, Venus and Adonis, lay in the bedchamber of every light of love in London. Is Catherine the shrew ill-favored? Hortensio calls her young and beautiful. Do you think the writer of Anth Antony and Cleopatra, a passionate pilgrim, had his eyes in the back of his head that he chose the ugliest doxy in all Warwickshire to lie with all? Good. He left her and gained the world of men. But his boy women are the women of a boy. Their life, thought, speech are lent them by males. He chose badly? He was chosen, it seems to me. If others have their will, Anne hath a way, by cock she was to blame. She put the comether on him, sweet and twenty-six, the grey-eyed goddess who bends over the boy Adonis, stooping to conquer as prologue to the swelling act, is a bold-faced Stratford wench who tumbles in a cornfield, a, young, a lover younger than herself. And my turn? When? Come. Ryefield, Mr. Best said brightly, gladly, raising his new book, gladly, brightly. He murmured then with blonde delight for all. Between the acres of the rye, these pretty country folk would lie. Paris, 
the well-pleased pleaser. A tall figure in bearded homespun rose from shadow and unveiled its cooperative watch. I'm afraid I am due at the homestead. Wither away, exploitable ground. Are you coming? John Eglinton's active eyebrows asked. Shall we see you at Moore's tonight? Piper is coming. Piper! Mr. Best piped. Is Piper back? Peter Piper pecked a peck of pick of peck of pickled pepper. I don't, I don't know if I can. Thursday? We have our meeting. If I can get away in time. Yogi Bogey Box in Dawson Chambers. Isis unveiled. Their pally book we tried to pawn. Cross-legged, under an umbral, umber shoot, he thrones an Aztec logos, functioning on astral levels. Their oversoul, Mahamat, Mahamat, Ma, the famous hermitess, await the light ripe for Chelship, ring round about him. Lewis H. Victory, T. Caulfield Irwin, Lotus ladies, tend them, eth eyes, their pineal glands aglow, filled with his god, he thrones bud under plantain, golfer of souls, engulfer, he souls, she souls, shoals of souls, engulfed with wailing cree cries, whirled, whirling, they bewail. In quintessential triviality, for years in this flesh case, a she soul dwelt. They say we are to have a literary surprise. The Quaker librarian said, friendly and earnest, Mr. Russell, rumor has it, is gathering together a sheaf of our younger poets' verses. We are all looking forward anxiously. Anxiously, he glanced in the cone of lamplight where three faces lighted shone. See this. Remember. Stephen looked down at a wide, headless cobean hung on his ash plan handle over his knee. My cask and sword, touched lightly with two index fingers, Aristotle's experiment, one or two. Necessity is that in virtue of which it is impossible that one can be otherwise. Argal, one hat, is one hat. Listen, young Colum and Starkey, George Roberts is doing the commercial part. Longworth will give it a good puff in the express. Oh, Willie? I like Colum's drover. Yes, I think he has that queer thing. Genius. Do you think he has genius, really? Yeats admired his line, as in wild earth a Grecian vase. Did he? I hope you'll be able to come tonight. Malachi Mulligan is coming, too. Moore asked him to bring Haynes. Did you hear Miss Mitchell, Mitchell, Mitchell's joke about Moore and Martin? That Moore is Martin's wild oats? Awfully clever, isn't, he? isn't it? They remind one of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza's. Panza. Our national epic has yet to be written, Dr. Surgeson says. Moore is the man for it, a knight of the rueful countenance here in Dublin. With a saffron kilt? O'Neill Russell? Oh yes, he must speak the grand old tongue. And is Dulcinea? James Stevens is doing some clever sketches. We are becoming important, it seems. Cordelia, Cordoglia, Cordoglio, Lear's loneliest daughter. Nux Houghton, now your best French polish. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell, Stephen said, rising. If you will be so kind as to give the letter to Mr. Norman. Oh, yes, if he considers it important, it will go in. We have so much correspondence. I understand, Stephen said. Thanks. Good it'll you. The pig's paper. <laughs> Bollock befriending. Singe has promised me an article for Dana too. Are we going to be read? I feel we are. The Gaelic tongue wants something in Irish. I hope you will come around tonight. Bring Starkly. Stephen sat down. The Quaker librarian came from the leave-takers. Blushing, his mask said, Mr. Daedalus, 
Your views are most illuminating. He creaked to and fro, tiptoeing up nearer heaven by the altitude of a chopine, and covered by the noise of outgoing, said low. Is it your view, then, that she was not faithful to the poet? Alarmed face asks me, why did he come? Courtesy or an inward light? When there is a reconciliation, Stephen said, there must have been first a sundering. Yes. Christ Fox in leather trues hiding, a runaway in blighted tree forks from hue and cry, knowing no vixen, walking lonely in the chaise. Women, he won to him, tender people, a whore of Babylon, ladies of justices, bully tapsters, wives, fox and geese, and in new place a slack dishonored body that once was comely, once as sweet, as fresh as cinnamon, now her leaves falling, all bare, frighted of the narrow grave and unforgiven. Yes, so you think the door closed behind the outgoer. Rest suddenly possessed the discreet vaulted cell, rest or warm and brooding air a vestal's lamp. Here he ponders things that were not. What Caesar would have lived to do had he believed the soothsayer? What might have been? Possibilities of the possible as possible. Things not known. What name Achilles bore when he lived among women? Coffin thoughts around me, in mummy cases, embalmed in spice or words. Thoth, god of libraries, a bird god, moony crowned. And I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest in painted chambers loaded with tile books. They are still. Once quick in the brains of men, Still but an itch of death is in them to tell me in my ear a maudlin tale, urge me to wreck their will. Certainly, John Engleton mused, of all great men, he is the most enigmatic. We know nothing but that he lived and suffered, not even so much. Others abide our question. A shadow hangs over all the rest. But Hamlet is so personal, isn't it? Mr. Best pleaded. I mean, a kind of private paper, don't you know, of his private life. I mean, I don't care a button, don't you know, who was killed or who was guilty. He rested an innocent book on the edge of the desk, smiling his defiance. His private papers in the original. Ta and Bal, Arantir. Time inno shagart, put burla on it, little John, quoth little John Engleton. I was prepared for paradoxes from what Malachi Mulligan told us, but I may as well warn you that if you want to shake my belief that Shakespeare is Hamlet, you have a stern task before you. Bear with me. Stephen withstood the bane of miscreant eyes, glinting stern under wrinkled brows. A basilisk. And quando vedi l'uomo latica, Messer Brunetto, I thank thee for thy word. As we, our mother Dana, weave and unweave our bodies, Stephen said, from day to day, their molecules shuttled to and fro, so does the artist weave and unweave his image. And as the mole on my right breast is where it was when I was born, through all my body has woven of new stuff time after time, so though the ghost of the unquiet father, the image of the unliving son looks forth. In the intense instant of imagination, when the mind, Shelley says, is a fading coal that which I was, is that which I am, and that which, it, which in possibility I may come to be. So in the future, the sister of the past, 
I may see myself as I sit here now, but by reflect from, reflection from that which then I shall be. Drummond of Hawthornden helped you at that style. Yes, Mr. Best said youngly. I feel Hamlet, qu Hamlet quite young. The bitterness might be from the father, but the passages with Ophelia are surely from the son. Has the wrong sow by the lug? Is he in my father? I am his son. That mole is the last to go, Stephen said, laughing. John Angleton made a, a nothing pleasing moe. If that were the birthmark of genius, he said, genius would be a drug in the market. The plays of Shakespeare's later years, which Renan admired so much breath and other spirit. The spirit of reconciliation, the Quaker librarian breathed. There can be no re reconciliation, Stephen said, if there has not been a sundering, said that. If you want to know what are the events which cast their shadow over the hell of time of King Lear, Othello, Hamlet, Troilus, and Cressida? Look to see when and how the shadow lifts. What softens the heart of a man, shipwrecked in storms dire, tried, like another Ulysses, Pericles, Prince of Tyre? Head, recondicapped, buffeted, pride blighted. A child, a girl placed in his arms. Marina, the leaning of sophists towards the bypass, or apoph apocrypha, is a constant quantity, John Angleton de detected. The high roads are dreary, but they lead to the town. Good bacon gone musty. Shakespeare Bacon's Wild Oats, Cipher Jugglers Going the High Roads, Seekers on the Great Quest. What town, good masters? Mummed in names, A, E, Eon, McGee, John Eglinton, East of the Sun, West of the Moon, Tir Na Nog, Booted the Twain and Staved. How many miles to Dublin? Three score and ten, sir. Will we Will we be there by candlelight? Mr. Brandes accepts it, Stephen says, as the first play of the closing period. Does he? What does Mr. Sidney Lee, or Mr. Simon Lazarus, as some of there his name is, say of it? Marina, Stephen says, a child of storm. Miranda, a wonder. Perdita, that which was lost. What was lost is given back to him, his daughter's child. My dearest wife, Pericles says, was like this maid. Will any man love the daughter if he has not loved the mother? The art of being a grandfather, Mr. Best can murmur. L'art d'être grand. His own image to a man with that queer thing genius is the standard of all experience, material and moral. Such an appeal will touch him. The images of other males of his blood will repel him. He will see in them grotesque attempts of nature to foretell or repeat himself. The benign forehead of the Quaker librarian enkindled rosily with hope. I hope Mr. Dedalus will work out his theory for the enlightenment of the public. And we ought to mention another Irish commentator, Mr. George Bernard Shaw. Nor should we forget Mr. Frank Harris. His articles on Shakespeare in the Saturday Review were surely brilliant. Oddly enough, he too draws for us an unhappy re relation with the Dark Lady of the Sonnets. The favoured rival is William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke. I own that if the poet must be rejected, such a rejection would seem more in harmony with, what shall I say, our notions of what ought not to have been. Felicitously, he ceased and held a meek head among them, ox egg, prize of their fray. He thou's and these her with grave husband words, dost love, Miriam? Dost love thy man? That may be too, Stephen says. There is a saying of Goethe's which Mr. McGee likes to quote. Beware of what you wish for in youth, because you will get it in middle life. Why does he send to one who is a buona roba, a bay where all men ride, a maid of honour with a scandalous girlhood, 
a lordling to woo for him. He was himself a lord of language and had made himself a coistral gentleman and had written Romeo and Juliet. Why? Belief in himself has been untimely killed. He was overborne in a cornfield first, ryefield, I should say, and he will never be a victor in his own eyes after nor play victoriously in the game of laugh and lie down. Assumed Don Giovannism will not save him. No later undoing will undo the first undoing. The tusk of the boar has wounded him there where love lies a-bleeding. If the shrew is worsted, yet there remains to her woman's invisible weapon. There is, I feel in the words, some goad of the flesh driving him into a new passion, a darker shadow of the first, darkening even his own understanding of himself. A like fate awaits him and the two rages commingle in a whirlpool. They list, and in the porches of their ears I pour. The soul has been before stricken mortally, a poison poured in the porch of a sleeping ear. But those who are done to death in sleep cannot know the manner of their quell unless their creator endow their souls with that knowledge in the life to come. The poisoning and the beast with two backs that urged it King Hamlet's ghosts could not know of where of were he not endowed with knowledge by his creator. That is why the speech, his lean, unlovely English, is always turned elsewhere, backward. Ravisher and ravished, what he would but would not, go with him from Lucrece's blue-circled ivory globes to Imogen's breast, bare with its mole sink-spotted. He goes back, weary of the creation he has piled up to hide him from himself, an old dog licking an old sore. But because loss is his gain, he passes on towards eternity in undiminished personality, untaught by the wisdom he has written or by the laws he has revealed. His beaver is up. He is a ghost, a shadow now, the wind by Elsinore's rocks or what you will, the sea's voice, a voice heard only in the heart of him who is the substance of his shadow, the son consubstantial with the father. Amen, responded from the doorway. Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? Entracte. A rivaled face, sullen as a dean's, Buck Mulligan came forwards then, blithe and motley, towards the greeting of their smiles. My telegram. You are speaking of the gaseous vertebrate, if I mistake not, he asked of Stephen. Primrose vested, he greeted gaily with his doffed panama, as with a bauble. They make him welcome. Vas du verlac, wirst du noch deinen. Brood of mockers, Fodius, Sudamalaki, Johann Most. He who himself begot, Midler of the Holy Ghost, and himself sent himself, Eigenbeier, between himself and others, who, put upon by his fiends, stripped and whipped, was nailed like bat to barn door, starved on cross tree, who let him bury, stood up, harrowed hell, fared into heaven, and there these nineteen hundred years sitteth on the right hand of his own self, but yet shall come in the latter day to doom the quick and dead, when all the quick shall be dead already. He lifts hands, veils fall, O oh, flowers, bells with bells with bells acquiring. Yes, indeed, the Quaker librarian said. A most instructive discussion, Mr. Mulligan, I'll be bound, has his theory too of the play and of Shakespeare. All sides of life should be represented. He smiled on all sides equally. Buck Mulligan thought, puzzled. Shakespeare, he said. I seem to know the name. A flying sunny smile rayed in his loose features. To be sure, he said, remembering brightly, the chap that writes like Singe. Mr. Best turned to him. Haynes missed you, he said. Did you meet him? He'll see you after at the DBC. He's gone to Gill's to buy Hyde's Love Songs of Canuck. I came to the museum, Buck Mulligan said. Was he there? The bard's fellow countrymen, John Eglinton answered, are rather tired, perhaps, of our brilliancies of theorizing. I hear that an actress played Hamlet for the 408th time last night in Dublin. Vining held that the prince was a woman. Has no one made him out to be an Irishman? Judge Barton, I believe, is searching for some clues. He swears, His Highness not his lordship, by St. Patrick. 
The most brilliant of all is that the story of Wilde's, Mr. Best said, lifting his brilliant notebook, that portrait of Mr. W.H., where he proves that the sonnets were written by William Hughes, a man of all, a man all Hughes. For Willie Hughes, is it not? The Quaker librarian asked. Or Huey Wills, Mr. William himself, W.H., who am I? I mean, for Willie Hughes, Mr. Best said, amending his gloss easily. Of course it's all paradox, don't you know? Hughes and Hughes and Hughes the color. But it's so typical the way he works it out. It's the very essence of wild, don't you know? The light touch. His glance touched their faces lightly as he smiled. A blonde, if he... Tame essence of wild. You're darn witty. The three drams of Usbek whiskey by you drank with Dan Easy Ducats. How much did I spend? Oh, a few shillings. For a plump of pressmen. Humor wet and dry. Wit. You would give your five wits for youth's proud livery he, he pranks in. Liniments of gratified desire. There may be mo. Take her for me. In pairing time. Jove, a cool time, send them. Yea, to love her. Eve, naked wheat bellied sin. A snake coils her. Fang ends kiss. Do you think it is only a paradox? The quick librarian was asking. The mocker is never taken seriously when he is most serious. They talk seriously of mocker's seriousness. Buck Mulligan's again heavy face eyed Stephen a while. Then his head wagging, he came near, drew a folded telegram from his pocket. His mobile lips red, smiling with new delight. Telegram, he said. Wonderful inspiration. Telegram. A papal bowl. He sat in a corner of the unlit desk, reading aloud joyfully. The sentimentalist is he who would enjoy without incurring the immense debtorship for a thing done. Signed, Daedalus. Where do you launch it from? The Kips? No. College Green. Have you drunk the four quid? The aunt is going to call on your substantial father. Telegram, Malachi Mulligan, the ship lower, Abbey Street. Oh, you peerless mummer. Oh, you priestified kinchite. Joyfully, he thrust the message and envelope into a pocket, but keened and querulous broke. It's what I'm telling you, Mr. Honey. It's queer and sick we were. Haynes and myself, the time himself brought it in. Twas murmur we did for a gallon potion, for a gallus potion would rouse a friar, I'm thinking, and he limp with leching. And we one hour and two hours and three hours in Connery sitting civil, waiting for pints apiece. He wailed. And we to be there, Mavrone, and you to be unbeknownst, sending us through conglomerations the way we have our tongues out of yard like the drouthy clerics to be fainting for a pussful. Stephen laughed. Quickly, warningfully, Buck Mulligan bent down. The tramper Singe is looking for you, he said, to murder you. He heard you pissed on his hall door in glass hole. He's out in Pamputis to murder you. Me! Stephen exclaimed. That was your contribution to literature. Buck Mulligan gleefully bent back, laughing to the dark eavesdropping ceiling. Murder you! He laughed. Harsh gargoyle face and wo that warred against me over our mess of hash, of lights in Rue Saint-André des Arts. In words of words, for words, palabras. Oisin, with Patrick. Fonman, he met me in Clarmart Woods, brandishing a wine bottle. C'est vendredi saint. Mothering Irish. His image wandering, he met. I mine. I met a fool in the forest. Mr. Lister, an attendant, said from the door ajar, in which everyone can find his own. So Mr. Justice Madden, in his diary of master silence, has found the hunting terms. Yes? What is it? There's a gentleman here, sir. The attendant said, coming forward and offering a card. From the freeman. He wants to see the files of the Kilkenny people for last year. Certainly, 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 is the gentleman. He took the eager card, glanced, not saw, laid down, unglanced, looked, asked, creaked, asked. Is he... Oh, there! Brisk in a gillard he was off and out. In the daylit corridor he, he talked with voluble pains of zeal, in duty bound, most fair, most kind, most honest, broad brim. This gentleman? Freeman's journal? Kilkenny people? To be sure. Good day, sir. Kilkenny? We have certainly. A patient silhouette waited, listening. All the leading provincial, Northern Whig, Cork Examiner, and Escort Three Guardian, 1903. Will you please? Evans, conduct this gentleman 
if you just follow the attend... Or please allow me. This way. Please, sir. Voluble. Dutiful. He led the way to all the provincial papers about a bowing dark figure following his hasty heels. The door closed. The sheeny! Buck Milligan cried. He jumped up and snatched the card. What's his name? Ikimos? Bloom, he rattled on. Jehovah, collector of prepuces, is no more. I found him over in the museum where I went to hail the foam-born Aphrodite. The Greek mouth that has never twisted in prayer. Every day we must do homage to her. Life of life, the lips a kindle. Suddenly he turned to Stephen. He knows you. He knows your old fellow. Oh, I fear me. He is Greeker than the Greeks. His pig Galilean eyes were upon her misial groove. <laughs> Phoenus Calipish. <laughs> oh, the thunder of those loins. The god pursuing the maiden hid. We want to hear more, John Eglinton decided, with Mr. Best's approval. We begin to be interested in Mrs. S. Till now, we had thought of her, if at all, as a patient Griselda. A Penelope stay at home. Antisethism. <laughs> Pupil of Gorgas. Stephen said, took the palm of beauty from Kyrgios Melanus. Rude dam. <laughs> Agreed, Helen. The woodman, mayor of Troy, in whom a score of heroes slept and handed it to poor Penelope. Twenty years he lived in London, and during part of that time he drew a salary equal to that of the Lord Chancellor of Ireland. His life was rich, his art more than the art of feudalism, as Walt Whitman called it, is the art of surfite. Hot herring pies, green mugs of sack, honey sauces, sugar of roses, march pain, gooseberried pigeons... Ringo Candies, Sir Walter Raleigh. When they arrested him, had half a million francs on his back, including a pair of fancy stays. The gone bin woman, Eliza Tordur, and underlinen enough to vie with her of Sheba. Twenty years he dallied there, between conjugal love and its chaste delights of scoratory love and its foul pleasures. You know Manningham's story of the burgher's wife who bade Dick Barbage to her bed? <laughs> after she had said, seen him in Richard III and how Shakespeare, overhearing, without more ado about nothing, took the cow by the horns and, when Burbage came knocking at the gate, answered from the capon's blankets. William the Conqueror came before Richard III, and the gay lakin, Mistress Fitton, mountain cryo, and his dainty birdsness. Lady Penelope Rich, a clean quality woman is suited for a player, and the punks of the bank side a penny a time. Pour la reine, encore vingt sous. Nous ferons de petites cochonneries. Minette, tu veux? The height of fine society and Sir William Davenant of Oxford's mother with her cup of canary for every cock canary. Buck Mulligan, his pious eyes upturned, prayed, Blessed Mary, Margaret Mary, any cock, and Harry of six wives' daughters and other lady friends from neighbor seats as Lawn Tennyson Gentleman poet sings. But all those twenty years, what do you do? Poor Penelope in Stratford. Was doing behind the diamond panes. Do and do. Thing done. In a rosary of Fetter Lane of Gerard. Herbalist, he walks. Great Auburn. An azard herba like her veins. Lids of Juno's eyes, violets. He walks. One life is all. One body. Do, but do. Afar in a reek of lust and squalor, hands are laid on whiteness. End of section 9A.